So we are like, there you go, Tanfo. This is this is what he had to say. This is what he gets for being on. <laughs> this is what I get. <laughs> he got a timer. <laughs> Was this like the third time you've been on time ever, Timmy? <laughs> That's why, he, uh, that's why he shoots so fast. He's always trying to make it up. It's not what you want to hear from somebody who's who's running matches now. <laughs> is that he can't be on time. I was thinking about shooting your match next year, Tim, but I don't know now if, if you're not going to keep things on time. <laughs> oh, goodness. So we're just waiting on Riley. He's uh, I just had to send him the email separate. Sometimes those things go to hey, Marcel. Uh, spam, so... All right. I guess that's Marcel Engelmeyer. Is that how yep. you can say that? All right. <laughs> Riley had this problem last time I had him on. Yeah, it's always hard when you're dealing with uh, with like trying to deal with people's connections and stuff like that on shows. You're just it's just this desperate, like I hope your connection actually lasts through the entirety of the program, and especially in situations like you had that debate with uh, who was it, Yimin and Luigi, and mm -hmm. it was funny because like Luigi would would make a point and then he'd be he'd be going going and then I'll just you just see it just die off, and it's like ah oh, that just ah oh, it's just so rough. Like even with the, even with our show, like we, we always run like this backup, just like just audio backup just so that we can try and sync it on the back end. Cause it's sometimes it's just hard to do. Well, that's a lot of editing. Yeah. That's a lot of time. That's, Leif, that's the one thing. Go ahead. Leif, how many holsters are you missing out on it for this? Oh, my day ended about an hour ago. Oh, nice. I've been in the shop since five thirty this morning. Oh, goodness. Well, the shop's just just close to you now, right? Because you, you you oh yeah, it's yeah. eighty yards behind the house. It's not a bad way to go, man. No, oh, it's nice. So how far how guess. far how far backlogged are you? Uh, pretty far back right now. It's a good problem um, to have. Well, I got way way further back than I ever wanted to, but oh. I've been making a lot of a lot of good headway on the backlog, and I, I'm at like. New orders coming in today are about 15 to 16 weeks, but okay. at, through the winter, I'm going to get that cut way down what and maybe it, change my business model a little bit once I get caught up. What does it take? I mean, like, what's the what's the time involved to do the average, an average holster? I do them in batches of eight seems to be the sweet spot for me. And okay. I can usually get eight done from start to finish and shipped in an 11 hour day. 10 to 11 hour a day, depending on a couple variables. Okay. But if everything's going right, that's about it. Can you, do you, does everything going right? Is that consistent for you? Um, in the shop, it's consistent. It's outside distractions that are hard to mitigate sometimes. Yeah. I'm working on cutting them out. I've got an echo. I do too. It's probably me. It just started. Yeah. I think it's Jay. <laughs> okay. Go I get to hear yeah, myself twice. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the hard thing. Like even what I do, I mean, it's like it doesn't take me long to design a home, but I just need that time to design. Right. And then inevitably, like just the amount of like dealing with administration stuff, helping out, helping out, uh, helping out employees, things like that. You're just like mm -hmm. you get to the end of the day and you're like, OK, what did I actually accomplish? Well, a lot. But what did I actually accomplish of what I wanted to? Nothing. Yeah. Like, cool, yeah. I'll work more. It doesn't take much for one distraction to turn into two or three and just snowball. Yeah. And before you know it, you've lost four hours. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's always a bit of a weird, a weird reality. Cause when you're, when all you're ever doing is just doing the one thing, it's easy to be like, oh, this is an easy job. And you're like, oh, right. no, now we need you to do everything yeah. else. Well, how am I going to do that? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it, it sucks. Every, every, it's, it, always, it always makes me laugh. People they say, you know, I want to, I want to be my own boss. I want to, I want to like pick my own hours. And it's like, yeah, yeah, you can eventually do that. You, I mean, you can either work the first twelve hours or the second twelve hours. Take your pick, because that's all. That's what you're getting.
All right, I'm going to go ahead and kick this thing off, and uh, Riley, Riley can join us. He just got here. In progress. Nice. I'm here. Perfect. Got to do the. I had to use the iPad. It won't yeah. work on the computer. Did, didn't we have that prop? Do you use a Mac, right? Yes. Yeah, there's something about your Mac and Eevee Mux. They don't like each other. I was starting to remember our last experience. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We like, almost did. It's a good thing I packed the, the uh, iPad with there me. There we are. <laughs> well, that's mildly concerning because I'm using a Mac. Oh, boy. <laughs> We're in trouble. Yeah, it's really weird. I don't know why. And I think, and actually, I don't, again, I don't know why, but I think um, Riley's the only one I know, guest wise, that's had that issue. Really odd. All right, I'm just going to cover my face. You guys can, well, you, I don't know if you can see below if you're on a computer, I can. But so the whole reason we're all gathered here today, well, first we have Scott Arnberg, Area 3 director, but also match director and 100,000 matches he's already put on at Isaac Walton, where he's at. Riley Bowman teaches, uh, instructs. He's uh, one of the guys at concealcarry.com doing all that stuff. Um, we've got Leif Kunkel, also match director extraordinaire, coming in from Kentucky. We've got Case Ryan coming in from, I think, somewhere in the middle of the country. Somewhere. They're all the same. So, somewhere. State. Somewhere, <laughs> somewhere <laughs> between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. That's where he's coming from. We're good there. Three-time division uh, GM. So we've got Jay Slater. I don't even know if he needs an introduction. Software extraordinaire. Everybody's gobbling that up. And Mr. Robert White himself, another match director and fellow podcaster. How you doing? Good. You, man, you got that radio voice, huh? I, I, tr I tried really hard. I, I mean, we, we, we try and... You. Yeah, we try and Your spend the money on decent stuff, but, you know, do the best we can anyway. All right. So the whole the whole reason we're gathered here is um, I've been doing a whole bunch of tracking of statistics just on division participation, which I think is pretty interesting. As you can see, the rise and fall of divisions, um, specifically carry optics and production and how they – they literally went in uh, completely opposite trajectories where CEO came in, I think, 2016, brand new, so zero people, and production was way up high with a lot of participation right up there with limited and open and has basically crashed to earth. And this is just... So these are just the top four divisions for this year. Now, my statistics, the reason why I wanted to talk to some other people is I don't, I'm not going to try to scour through practice score to find um, local match data. That would be way too much. Um, but I know you guys have access to your own matches that you run. So I felt that would be a, a good comparison, but this year so far, level twos and above, not counting nationals because they're too specific, but carry optics is 40% of all participation in level twos and above. Open comes in at second and half of that at 20. Then you got limited at 11, PCC at 11. And then you get limited optics at, uh, they're brand new, which that's a different conversation. They're already up to 7.21. You got production, which is all the way down to 6%. Single stack at between two and a half and three, and revolver at one. And at limited 10 is so is almost off the scale. So I didn't even include that because it's a half a percent. Now, yeah. are you guys finding the numbers the same where you're at, or is there something funky? No, I mean, I know in, I know in Utah, uh, specifically, I mean, especially our biggest club slips, uh, uh, when all this, when carry optics first came out limited was by far the, the market leader in everything we did. And I mean, you actually had a really big contingent of limited shooters and by today's standards, it's actually completely flipped. Uh, carry optics has now taken over the limited slot 
and limited is it's staffed by people who are just diehard iron sight shooters who are exceptionally talented in in their field but there is no doubt that if it has an optic that's what people want to shoot that makes sense it riley is that what you're seeing at all of your the stuff that you teach are you seeing mostly optics coming through absolutely we've seen that over the last three, four years. I remember say three, three or four years ago, I'd be teaching a class and there'd be, you know, say a class of 12 students. Um, nine of them would be iron sights, three would be optics. And then like the next year it was like half and half. And then last year it was 75% optics. And then this year it's one or two, maybe in a full class are running wow. irons. Uh, I, I think it's kind of to be expected. It, it's, I, I've witnessed this transition from, you know, iron sight pistol being the preferred tool of choice amongst law enforcement, military, civilians carrying them over the last five, six, seven years. And it has shifted completely the opposite direction. And that carries over, I think, into our sport as well. It, it's it's uh, er, er, everywhere I look, it's Optics on a slide, a uh, slide right optic on a pistol is where it's at these days, by and large. Yeah, Riley, I think you make a good point there. This is a, a shift in the the gun community as opposed to a, a change in USPSA. This is just a reflection of what's going on. You know, I, I looked. We, we've ran uh, just under thirty matches this year, um, including uh, our our sectional and we'll get one to two new people a week and 90% of them have a dot on their pistol. Um, it's just, it's more and more common. My home club, you know, I spend a few hours out there every weekend, uh, doing some practice and training and interacting with the membership. We have 850 members, um, and dots are far more prevalent on pistols just for the people there practicing the, the Joe average that does not compete. Um, and it's just easier to be successful, I think, is the biggest thing. 100%. So I have a theory on why Limited in particular was so popular because, you know, the prevalent round of Limited um, is 40, but that's not that's not a round people really carry. And even in the last, even prior to uh, the explosion of dots, 40 was not necessarily a common round. It was 10, 15 years ago. Um, all the LE departments have moved away from it pretty much everybody doesn't carry it anymore, but it's, it's, it's a little bit anecdotal, but it's, it's what I've seen a lot of is that when people come into the sport or when they used to come into the sport, they would buy a Glock 19 or equivalent handgun. They would show up, they'd have a nine millimeter iron sighted gun. They don't have enough magazines to shoot production mm -hmm. or they know they're going to miss a lot. So they just, just turn the limit. And they, they shoot in limited. And what I did, well, I'm starting to shoot limited. I'll just buy a person barrel. Or they'll buy, they'll shoot limited until they have enough money to buy a, uh, a, a proper limited gun. And they just stay in that division that they know because that's what they've been shooting. That's what they started in. Well, now you put a dot on your gun that you start with. If you're a new shooter, you're automatically in CO. And there's not necessarily... And an upper limit to that. Now, limited optics is going to change that, I think. But CO is where you start. CO is where you get super, super competitive, and there's a lot of heat in there. So you just stay in CO, and that's why it's so popular. Yeah, we've seen. Um, so I run a, and it's an an introduction match that I run for um, a number of years, and we do it once a month. And in the beginning, it was like we said, all iron sights. But now, um, every month, we'll have um, tw about twenty people that'll do it. And inside of that 20, probably three quarters of them are running some kind of a dot. Even if, if it's a P365 XL or something like that, everybody's, they've all got dots on them. The people that are running iron sights are usually not to sound ageist. I mean, they're, they're usually older people who, um, this is the gun that I have. This is the gun that I carry. And this is what I'm going to always carry. Occasionally you'll have somebody will show up and they'll be very specific to like, I'm going to shoot a 1911 because I just like 1911. But by and large, the world has moved to the dots. And it, it, there's no doubt that, I mean, the optical aiming system just 
it makes everything else so much easier to, it's basically giving a 16 year old an automatic versus a manual transmission. And yeah, the kind industry, of in- you know, <laughs> as ahead. far as gun, gun manufacturers are supporting that because you see more and more manufacturers selling guns with optics already mounted on them. Uh, and, and so that just furthers this even more. And it makes sense because it's also opportunity for greater profits for manufacturers. So uh, you see, you're going to see more and more of this, I think, as more manufacturers uh, put together packages where, right from the factory, or at least on your, on the store shelves, you're going to see any number of different brands of pistols with any number of different brands of optics on them. And that's what people are going to be buying and, and chances are running in matches. Now, Lafer, is that what you're seeing in your neck of the woods as well? Yeah, absolutely. As a whole, um, kind of in addition to what Case was saying in terms of uh, limited participation, it has been um, kind of falsely exaggerated, the participation numbers in limited for the last couple of years, just because a lot of people that showed up with iron sights instead of shooting production would just shoot mm-hmm. limited minor. So those numbers aren't really accurate of true limited participation. Yeah. But there's a lot of new shooters that show up to our matches now that have never shot iron sights before in their life. It's probably the majority of them that come and shoot their first match. They show up with a dot and they don't know anything else. That's that's actually really impressive. I mean, because it seems like for a long time, it's like you start with an iron sight gun and then you go to an optic. Yeah. But for them to actually be coming in with an optic, like I know how to use an optic. That's I never right. would have thought that, but that's amazing. Yeah. And that's, it's crazy that it's all happened in the last three to four years. Like I was looking at the numbers for the uh, section matches I ran since 2020. And we're kind of a little bit of an anomaly in this part of the country with low cap uh, participation, or at least we were because there was the battle in the bluegrass match that took place for the course of 10 years. So it was like a core group of low cap people here. And my 2020 Kentucky section match production was the largest division in the match. Oh yeah. And now it's second to the smallest division in the match. If you take, sorry, Jay revolver and L 10 out. (laughs) (laughs) And Jay, you were going to say something earlier. What were you going to say? Yeah. Just uh, kind of the same thing here. Um, I was actually, I was the only low cap shooter at my local match, uh, in October, which makes me a little sad, but, uh, and, and how many shooters would that be? I would, we had, a uh, like 55 or 60 for that, I think. And so, and just one, so 1%. Wow. Yeah. Well, two, two ish. The, yeah, well, uh, true. Yeah. Two percent. As, as people have been saying, um, the like limited as a catch all for newbies coming in that, that does hold true in the data too. Uh, Looking at like a like a big set of locals, probably forty or fifty percent of limited activity is in minor, and almost nobody shooting limited seriously shoots it in minor. So that's kind of almost certainly going to be the like the beginners coming in with two magazines or three instead of four or five. Yeah, the capacity uh, point is interesting as well because guns used to ship. It used to be standard where you max you get is a fifteen round gun or 15 round magazine. So dropping down to 10 is not that significant. Now you buy a subcompact concealed carry weapon and you're going to get minimum of a 15 round magazine in there. Uh, right. people are carrying yeah. 17, 18. I know a lot of folks that carry 140 millimeter magazine. They, they take a, a USPSA designed base pad and that's what they carry with. Now I don't necessarily do that just cause I, I like to try it. I'm a kind of a smaller guy to pr- I print a lot, but um, I'm carrying 17, 18 rounds. So it, to me going, if, if your concealed carry weapon or your defensive weapon is kind of your end of the shooting sports, which for a lot of people, it is dropping down to, to a, something that's really low cap is it's painful. You don't understand it. You wouldn't want to do it. So you just stay in the right. high cap stuff. Yeah. I just, I just did a quick look. Our, our last, uh, slips and match that we had here, only 5% of the, uh, people that shot shot low cap. I mean, it's, that's, that is, that's a pretty high number. Yeah. What are you seeing, Scott, numbers wise for just low cap in general? Oh, they, they pretty much mimic what you have here. Uh, Limited, I would say is half that at our local. Um, Carry optics is, is north of 40. Um, I mean, I I don't remember who said it, but the, the observation that uh, limited minor is a thing I, I was trying to find. Uh, we've been provided that number. I want to say it's like 40, 50% of the limited 
um, scores yeah, there's, shot there's, each year are minor. There's more limited minor shooters than there are major shooters. Yes. There, there was a report yeah. that actually came out with that, which makes sense because it does speak to what you're saying. Though, but it, it is a catch-all for somebody. Sh- I mean, when you do the new shooter orientation at a match, yep. the new the guys show up and you're like, what are you shooting? Well, this is what I got. Are you, what division? I don't know. Cool. Fill the mags up. Go have fun. And yeah. that, that's what well, you, you that, tell every single one of them. Yeah, that's a conversation we have. I said, how many, you have three magazines. I said, okay, well, you have two options. You know, the, the biggest stages will probably be 30, 32 rounds. If you don't miss, um, you can load your mags to 10 uh, or you can fill them up. What, what, what do you want to do? Uh, and invariably, they want to fill them up. They, you know, and the first couple matches, the goal there is just to get them through safely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I kind of track is uh, people that come and shoot one, two matches don't come back. Uh, every once in a while, I'll send out emails and say, "Hey, what what happened? Why why didn't you come back?" And a few of them, they it it has brought uh, to light some some personality challenges I have in my home club uh, that I have to deal with uh, and and try to offset. Um, and some of it is just it's it's too intimidating. I, I can't afford ammo, um, and you know. And then I'll, I'll also go back periodically and email people that you know were really big in it and then just disappear. At my home range, I, I coordinate all the shooting sports, and you know I had a. 22 club that I took from nothing to running, you know, bi-weekly matches and both my match directors moved away and now it's gone. Uh, so it, it happens mm-hmm. if you, if you don't have that person, uh, don't have that advocate for your, your sport, it, it just won't happen. Well, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, it's a kind of another issue, but it does speak to this idea. One of the challenges that we have in USPSA generally is this lack of a mentorship program to bring up new people. I mean, cause we bring somebody into a match and they get excited and they want to shoot it, but okay, well, they're shooting the matches, but how do we get them into the role of a stage designer, stage designer? into this match there's no real pathway that we actively take it so inevitably that burnout that everybody eventually will go through occurs Mm -hmm. and if there's nobody there waiting in the wings it's hard yeah that's why most that's why clubs fail some of that comes down to Mm. down to interest though um i know a lot of the people uh a lot of people i encounter who take the sport relatively seriously uh around here at least are like they'll they'll help out, I guess, at, at various clubs. But like, there's there's a set of them that uh, people who are regular shooters who aren't really interested in pitching in, and you know, that's their prerogative, I guess. But it's it's also not the kind of thing that's easily solved by like a by a mentorship sort of program. That's true. Well, and and the I think the more serious someone takes their shooting, the less likely they are to volunteer. Because volunteering and putting on matches. Uh, I know myself, you know, I, I'm, I'm 51 years old. Um, I, I am in reasonable health, much better than I used to be a few years ago. But if I go and set up a match and if I just go and shoot a match, my performance is much different. Yeah. And, and if you're serious about your performance, um, you know, it's, it's a detriment towards running matches. Well, I guess yeah. that brings the question, though. I mean, how do you how do you solve that? Because at the, at, at the end of the day, I mean, you, you have to, I mean, one of the challenges with USPSA and you kind of alluded to this, Scott, is that, you know, you have people that are coming in, but you're also losing people on the back end. It's just the churn, right? And so how do you get people um, to buy into the idea of what USPSA actually is long enough that they then want to stick around, help see the thing grow, and then bring people on behind them? It's, one of the things that I've been trying to do, and it's very difficult, is to try to get the people that are focused on their performance to understand how much better they're going to be by shooting on high quality stages, well thought out stages, and right. what it takes to make that happen. It, it's cyclical. So even if it's just their designing stages and it gets them thinking more about stage design and shooting challenges and things like that, that's a good way to start and without sacrificing your own performance i would say that makes sense running running a match actually i think has been good for me uh, on the whole performance wise because i've got i get the chance to uh 
to set up things that I want to see in match conditions, not just uh, like on a practice. I do the same. I typically will pick a theme of the month of skills I want to test. So we run a, a, a U, four, four to five stage USPSA match every Tuesday night. Um, I hit the range at three in the afternoon. We're usually shooting by 530. We're done and cleaned up by 830. Um, and I will pick skills that I want to do each month. Um, you know, one early this season, one of the things I was multiple engagements where you have targets that are visible from multiple places in this in the stage and you have to remember hey did i shoot that there is no penalty per se other than the time it took you to put six rounds in that target that really only required two um, and that's much more palatable to your new shooters as opposed to hanging a tux out there at 35 yards and saying enjoy right um so for a while we shot a swingers and plate racks because uh, i went to a level two and sucked at those and so i was like hey this is, we got to quit doing this i think i think i mean like i started i started the introduction to uspsa match years ago and the reason i did it was because when i first started shooting competitively uh, i showed up at a match and i didn't know anybody and i always figured it was one of, like one of the single hardest things about i tell this in my match uh when i introduce this thing is like I think a little bit has to do is showing up your first match. Because once you actually get there and get to run you come back and then bring a friend. But and so when we're building these matches, I mean we're always it's what you say, Leif. I mean you want to build quality stages that stages that you would see at a nationals level match. And at the same time you can't build a stage that is just gonna crush a new shooter's spirit. And so they like, okay, well let's put this new shooter thing, give people the tools and the tips necessary to at least understand how the game mechanics work so that when they actually go to a larger match, they they don't get there and they see that swinger at thirty five yards and suddenly be like, Oh, I'll never be this good again. Yep. And I think there I think there's so much value in bringing bringing new people in um, almost on an entry level, uh, just trying to help them understand this game. Any game before you truly understand how the mechanic of the game actually work. One of the things that I found is super successful on engaging and retaining that, that person who has the courage to come to the first match is a buddy system. I mean, we've all done something new where you go and, and you know, you get there and you're like, well, I don't, I don't even know who to ask questions to. Um, and so my, my stats guy, Andrew Smithson, and I work together. Um, he, he does the new shooter briefing, does the check-in and, and all that stuff so I can focus on stage design and making sure that they, they're reasonable. Um, but then we assign a new person to a buddy and say, okay, hey, and I, you know, I have about 10 different people in my club that I know their ROs, their experienced shooters, and they're personable uh, that I can say, okay, hey, this is Tom. Tom will be your buddy tonight. You're going to shoot with him. You follow him around. And if you have questions, he's the person that is, is going to be there to answer your questions all night that you don't have to feel bad about asking questions to. Right. And that has been super successful on one, getting people through their first match successfully and two, getting them to actually come back. I love that. Uh, I think it's so, so key. Um, there's a lot of things I'm not able to do volunteer wise in this sport just because of my family life, my schedule, running businesses and all that. But, uh, one of the things I may, I am able to be, uh, that I am able to do is I teach at a couple of training conferences each year. And one thing that's been fairly popular that I've done as a, like a, like a course block at those training conferences is an intro to competitive shooting. And it's really cool to see how many people actually have interest and for the first time, they kind of feel like they can dip their toe in it because it's actually a class to help them do that. Um, that's, you know, four hours long. So it's typically longer than what most of your, you know, initial new shooter briefings, whatever, uh, that a lot of clubs run. Um, and so I'm able to cover a lot of stuff with them and, and kind of also help them understand the culture and what's expected and, you know, and how matches are run and all of that. Um, and then they get to shoot a stage once or twice, uh, depending on you know, how the time we have and how many people we have. And we have a great time and it gets them in, involved. And it's really been reassuring to see how many of those past students have gone through that intro to competitive shooting course have messaged me to say, hey, I signed up for my first match. Hey, I, I just went and shot my first level two and stuff like that. There's been a bunch of them that have done that. 
And uh, not to toot my own horn too much, but there, you know, there's, there's a point here because I think you know a lot of us are talking about you know, there's got to be a buddy system, a mentoring system, you know, something like that. And that's going to vary obviously from, cl from club to club because every club's going to have to figure that out for themselves unless there's some way of uh, making something happen more on a national level. Um, but uh, the one thing that has been unfortunate to hear is there's been a handful of reports because one of the pieces of advice I give folks that go through this course block with me is, hey, get on practice score, find a match in your area, sign up send a message to the match director or whoever the point of contact is on that practice score listing. Let them know it's your first time. You're excited to get started. Um, you probably have some questions. You know, I, I just basically kind of prep them, like ask them, let them know you're new, ask about a new shooter brief briefing, all that stuff. And unfortunately, there's been a few reports that have come back from some of these new folks that have been like, well, I did this and I felt like the response I got was really cold or like I was you know, bugging them in some way, or they were just, you know, flat out rude, um, you know, sometimes from match directors, which is always disappointing to hear. And sometimes the match directors are wonderful. Um, but then they show up in just kind of that local culture of, you know, all these people there and the relationships that are already formed doesn't always necessarily feel super welcoming. All that stuff's tough to, to navigate. And, uh, you know, every club's got to figure it out for themselves, but it's just, uh, you know, if you're out there and you're listening, it's it's something worth giving some thought to as to how we um, get more people in and make sure we keep them and make sure it's warm and inviting for them. Right. Do you guys do you get when you're having these conversations and, and your new shooters and, and things like that? Does the conversation of, of divisions come up with them? Because oh I, yeah, my, my my experience again is is quite limited, probably compared to you guys, since it's been a long time I, that I've been. Uh, pretty involved at a local level um does does is there much beyond the oh this is what you need to be or this is where you should be or do they are the new shooters asking where do i want to be a year into this if i'm going to be super competitive so when at, at my match when we have the guys show up um on my on my form when they actually fill out i say if you don't know what division you are just say just uh put limited limited unclassified because it's, it's an easy thing. Uh, since more and more people are showing up in carry optics, they'll usually uh, sit here. But I'll take I'll take a few minutes and I'll be and I'll just go through. We'll do the roll call and I'll say, "What are you shooting?" They're like, "I don't know." I'm like, well, "What gun is it?" Well, it's a Glock. Does it have a dot on it? Yes. Cool. You're now shooting carry optics. That's all they care about. They don't need to know that they don't. Oh, I have a single stack. Was it a minor, major? Yeah, we'll get into that. But at the outro. All they need to know is I got a dot and I got a bunch of bullets and I want to shoot it. And that's, yeah. that's, that's as far down the rabbit hole as we get. Sometimes I have seen in the, in kind of the, to new people, we're so excited as competitors and whatnot that we just want to tell them everything. Hey, have you seen the latest like thumb safety on this 1911? It's the greatest thing ever. And you really need to know all of it. Well, no, I just need to know which way to point the gun. And when they're brand new, it's like you either fill up, you will fill up the bullets in the gun with iron sights or you fill it up in carry optics. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And we just, we kind of keep it really basic at the, at the intro level when they want to actually get to the point where they, where they care and they know what division they're going to be in, they'll figure that out, but that's going to be the second, third, fourth, whatever matches. And at that point they'll have had, made some friends and they'll, they'll be off the races and have a good idea what equipment they actually need for the game. Yeah, they already yeah. feel like they're drinking from the fire hose, navigating stages in the first place. They don't need to know all that. Yeah. So that, that three matches in is is where it's key, though. That's that's where they're making a decision on on or four matches or whatever, whatever that is, six months. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's where they're making a decision on where they want to go and try to be competitive if, if they so choose to do so. Um, um, so, you know, am I going to take this flashlight off my off my CO gun or um or am I going to try to change calibers, shoot major, or you know, do I need to change magazines so I'm fitting the, the rules? That's, I think, where this discussion needs to kind of go because that's where we, we have, if they're not caring where they're at in those first couple matches, then tailoring the divisions to them um, has not been not super important. Although I will say when, uh, when the board opted to allow flashlights for – um, CO limited, um, 
I think it was just those two divisions. Uh, I thought that was a great division. I know there was a lot of pushback. Uh, however, to me, it was a way to allow new shooters, the tactical Timmies or just the everyday carry kind of folks who weren't familiar with competitive shooting to show up with whatever they had and didn't feel like they were, you know, going to be pushed against all the open guns, which are super intimidating. So that, that was a good decision in my book, but once they spend a few months shooting a few matches, now they got to make a decision on where they want to go. Um, what are you guys seeing in terms of, uh, their opinions on which division is the right one to be in? I want to actually jump in first and say, you've actually made a very good point about the purpose of divisions too. Um, now, as a revolver guy, obviously, uh, this is maybe slightly motivated reasoning, but uh, <laughs> but 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 I, but I think that the purpose of a, of a division is to group guns together such that inside that division, the difference in scores is down to scale and not gear. Okay. Now, I I do have a question. On all this talk of new shooters, um, I'm, I'm going to throw some statistics here from the screen. I have a specific question for all you guys too, is it, it looks like PCC and CO were basically the same in 2018 and PCC got as high as 13% participation twice. And that seems to be where it's about peaked. Are you guys seeing when are you guys seeing at the local level, people switching over to PCC or are they coming with PCC? I don't think I've seen they switched to yeah news that come up for PCC like people people who shoot PCC they've been doing it for a while uh, or they're doing it for fun as a break from their main division in my experience. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it's PCC is either because they're the, the, a small minority want to carry on their rifle training, um, and a few think it's uh, novelty, and I. Th think uh, a good chunk of them and boy i'm going to catch fire for this but uh, I, I still think it's a it's an observation it's because they can't run the pistol whether it's physical limitation practice limitation whatever uh it's a way for them uh it's similar to the difference between shooting an iron sided pistol and a red dotted pistol mm. just the the barrier okay. the barrier of hitting the yeah. target is is much easier yeah. um I will say it is it is much more of a gun manipulation challenge PCC than it is uh, a Correct. shooting challenge in the street sense. And from from what I hear, uh, I guess from uh, others of Dave's guests, um, is that that's the way the PCC guys like it. Yeah, yeah. and it's very yeah. regional. Um, you know, I've I've that's true. RM'd I've RM'd four different uh, level twos this year all over the Midwest. And until I went down to um, Rawa to the the Missouri Fall Classic. PCC was a very small handful and man, they had a bunch. Uh, they had as many PCCs as they had, I think open, I'd have to look at the results, but it was a lot. And it's, that's just because of that region. They have a lot of people that like to shoot together. And, yeah. you know, so there's, there's that, that challenge. Right. From my observation, uh, the, what I, what I tend to see here in Colorado a lot at our local matches is Many of the PCC shooters are there because they also shoot uh, carbine matches or two gun matches or something like that, and they see it as just another opportunity to keep working their their carbine skills, their manipulation skills, whatever. Yeah, the PCC is a lot of fun. I I won't give up the pistol for it. That's kind of where I'm at. I think some of PCC's early popularity had to do with the fact that uh, in about 2018 it was. Um, it was about as fast as you could go per dollar you spent. And once the mm. once the once the CEO guns got the bigger magazines and that started to take off, I think the the calculus then shifted. Now PC now carry optics rather is a little bit uh, a little bit cheaper per unit speed. And I think you hit the nail on the head, Jay. Yeah. I, I really do because you you saw that in the numbers in 2018 they were about on they were about the same and then as uh, USPSA shooters started proving out and breaking all the optics and the making the companies actually build better optics you saw more people going into carry optics and it was a much more reliable platform and it was like in 2018 this was this was one of the first mainstream minor division that you could stick a dot on and so PCC was exciting but carry optics became viable and the optics became reliable and it just it just left everything in the dust it's 
carry optics a go fast division without having to do the 2011 dance yeah 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 well and if you look here i mean area two like like going back to what scott was just saying it's definitely region specific because the area this is the area two match i mean they're they're it's third in popularity behind co and open so it's definitely region specific i i would be not, not as popular to... in area three though I would I would be interesting to correlate that across with a, a median age. Mm. See my, that would my... Be... I, I I would suspect if you look at the median age of the PCC competitor, uh, it would be higher than other divisions. My uh, my question would be correlating it east versus west across the country. Um, as uh, I think it's, as Riley observed, uh, it's it's pretty common for PCC guys to be in from a like a carbine match and. There aren't a ton of those here out east just because, you know, our deepest bay at our range is like 30 yards uh, down. That's pretty skinny. You can't put, you can't do very interesting carbine stages uh, in a lot of the, well, in this part of the country. And it's much easier when you've got vast deserts to, uh, to do it in. Well, I know anecdotal evidence of one club. Um, we shoot all through the year, even in the winter, and having 45 rounds in a gun uh, that you don't have to drop a magazine on the ground sure is a really nice option come uh, <laughs> middle of winter. Uh, you mean you don't have enough feeding devices to shoot a whole match on your, uh, just without, like, without reusing a single one? Uh, I do. Most don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's funny that you say that. Cause I kind of graphed like two to three discrete, uh, local matches from my club each year from 2019 to present. And the spikes in PCC activity are in November and December of every mm -hmm. single year. Yeah. Well, that's the that, off season. Mm, that's right. That's when people, it's, it's, yeah, it's having fun. Oh, and oh, I've had that same totally, thought. That's a good like point. My, I, my season ends next week after I shoot Ipsic nationals. And I, I have wanted, I got a PCC up there. I want to take that thing off the wall and just go rip with it. As soon as I'm done, just not going to practice. I'm just going to go to the local match and just have fun. Cause it, it is a ton of fun to shoot, but it's not, it's totally different. And, uh, my, my experience with it, like not my personal experience, but just seeing folks that show up to matches with it, uh, is that they're, they're just visiting, they're just visiting PCC. They're, they're Correct. taking a break. Um, maybe they want to be competitive, uh, with it for a year, work on their rifle skills, but it's not something that they take super seriously. I like the way you say that. That's actually a really, that's a really good way to describe that. They're just visiting. They did, they grab, they grab the gun. They want to come out and just shoot it a little bit and have a good time with it. I mean, cause I mean, I know a lot of us are that way. And like I have a 45, uh, a 45 ACP SBR that I shoot and I shoot it just because I like to shoot the gun. Is it competitive? Heck no, but it's safe. It's really it's, fun. It's safe queen guilt. Yes. <laughs> yes. You open the safe and you see that gun in there and it's like, oh yeah, I, sh I should sell that. Nope. I'll shoot it to say that I've shot it in the last year. Exactly. Because then it's no longer a safe queen. There you go. Unfortunately, that didn't save my revolvers. Mm. <laughs> well, the, the switch to eight really hurt revolver in the, in the sense uh, of make it possible to visit. I, I'll admit that I was pretty salty over that because I had a pair of 625s mm. all done up and I was all of a sudden not competitive. Yeah. No, it yeah. Um, we had a guy came out and shot our Utah State match this year and he was the first person I've seen in probably eight years that actually shot a 45 uh shot major as revolver and um i watched him shoot it and i was like i am really glad i don't shoot that because it was painful you you're responsible for every round man because they are mm -hmm. precious oh yeah yeah the term standing reload was like every single stage Oof. now this is what i was uh talking about earlier so in 2018, production was at 21.76, which would put it third, right behind open. Limited was actually leading, it, uh, at least in the level two matches. But it has consistently gone downhill from 21 to 17 to 14, 12, 7, or 8, down to 6. Like it, there's, um, it has definitely taken a hit. Interesting too that single stack has slowly gone down. Well, in the last couple of years, it seems to have really gone down. So I'm not sure 
what has happened there. Well, but generally, it's, it's because the pe the people that are still shooting single stack have slowly died. Well, <laughs> well, and, and <laughs> they're gotten older now. They're in PCC. <laughs> well, I, I I think it's a, a lot of factors. One, it's if you think about the the cost of a carry optics gun in eighteen versus today. Uh, True. You can I, you can't you can't hardly find. I, I can't think of a single manufacturer that doesn't offer a plastic gun that's optics ready from the factory. Uh, yeah. at, at a price point less than or the same of for the same gun in, in 2018, whereas 1911s have only gotten more expensive. Uh, as, machine, as machine time goes up and the, the cost of metal, um, so the barrier to entry to carry optics, one, it's cheaper to get in, and two, now we have optics um, you know, that are very reliable. Very reliable at, you know, what's the... What is the the new Hollow Sun comp? Whatever it's what three fifty out the door, three sixty. Yeah. They're it's really inexpensive, like that, yeah. and they work. They they're re, they, and they work, work exceptionally yeah. well. Yeah. So you can you could be sub thousand dollars and and be competitive. You know, have a gun that that isn't going to hold you back in carry optics. Right. For a long long time. I mean, I mean, Nils proves that. What's he he shoots a right. a a canic a canic that's you know. Five hundred dollars out the door. Throw a dot on, and you're at eight hundred, and and wins. And you can win a national championship. Well, yeah. and I mean, and I mean, honestly, I mean, carry optics in USPSA and and even dots in in the consumer market as a as a general thing. I mean, they have USPSA to thank for that because the reliability that an optic is today, when carry optics first started in 2018 or whatever. I mean, it was not uncommon for a person to go through two, three, four dots in a single season because they just broke a lot. Yeah. And at the time, the the Delta Point Pro was considered the most reliable uh, optic in the market. And I still went through, what was it, four of them in one season. Yeah. You've got the main, well, the backup, and the one in for warranty. Yeah. Yeah. And it was well, that's just what it was. But they've gotten so much better that it makes it easy for your for your newer shooters and people that are interested in carry optics to buy uh, an inexpensive gun, put a quality optic on it, and dude, they're off to the races. Right, and it's minor scoring, so they can buy, you know, factory ammo and mm -hmm. and be fine. Um, you can even there's. I remember when I first got into it, I was going to the local gun show. And I think they were called North Georgia. They sold remanufactured ammo. It was very good, but it was much cheaper than the other stuff. So I was able to, like you said, I had a plastic gun with a, an inexpensive dot, inexpensive ammunition. And then the local matches are inexpensive to shoot. So it yeah, all worked yeah. out well. So we're at an interesting time because we're talking about divisions and I think everybody who's involved in USPSA is, is kind of on the same, uh, same sheet of music where there's going to be some change or there, there probably needs to be some change coming up soon. And we're at this time where ammo is, is to, to go buy it from the factory is the same price, if not cheaper than reloading your own ammo at home. Uh, unless you're shooting 38 super comp, <laughs> it is cheaper to go buy factory nine mil than it is to load it um, with current component prices. So I'm curious to see how that will change everybody's perspective on um, on the division thing, because I think the power factor discussion is is huge. Um, in what way? I, I don't know if if major power factor in in limited has a place in the future in single stack has a future. I know we're going to get to this discussion in a little bit, but. <clears throat> if we have the the same uh, divisions that we have um, in, in five years, there's going to be nobody, almost nobody shooting some of these things, and it's not going to be a viable competitive division. Sure. Uh, and does it make sense uh, to start consolidating the divisions? And if we do that, then we really have to have the discussion of when do we get when do we start looking at get rid of, getting rid of uh, major and minor power factor in some of these divisions. See, I think this is this is where I'm going to come out as a bit of a, a bit of a heretic on kind of the, the received USPSA community wisdom right now, because I don't think a division being small is 
uh, necessarily a reason to uh, to consolidate it or to exit from this board or other such ideas that I've heard. Um, so my, my perspective, uh, my question uh, to you, I guess, is what about a small division is actively bad? How is it harming the sport? So having having a um, having too many divisions takes away from the competitiveness. You get folks spreading out. Now you're gonna. I I I, I think I understand the, the counter argument. Um, however, I think there there's no advantage to having eight or ten different divisions um, across a relatively niche sport. If we can start so the way that this is trending, where we're at right now is one thing. I let, let's all agree. L 10 has got to go. So if we get rid of L 10, um, I, I won't agree so. with that because, you know, you take area seven, for example, uh, like 70, 80% of the States are limited to 10 round magazines. And so if yeah. they want to travel abroad, it gives them an option, uh, to compete with the same stuff they have. Now they don't, right. They don't, but so what, what, well, I mean, d the numbers speak for themselves. Look, look at that area well, seven. But that's the that's kind of the funny thing, though, is USPSA has already built into its rule book a way to handle uh, participation, and even even if we, I mean, I mean, L ten revolver single stack, um, those are still divisions that people want to shoot, and as long as people are wanting to shoot them, there's no reason necessarily to get rid of them because we have a rule right. that says that if you don't have this many. If you don't have enough people competing in a division, and I understand this is mostly at a, a level two and above, but if you don't have enough people, then they don't have to be recognized. And I think the best thing you can do, and honestly, I, Scott, I think you may have said this, but the way to handle that is if you're running a level two or above and you notice that you've got some L10 guys, it's it's nice for the match director just to reach out and be like, hey, guys, there's only three people in this thing, and I'm happy to have you shoot it, but we're not going to recognize it. Correct. I, I want to say my only my only issue is when you have um, like at, at handgun nationals, which was supposed to be iron sight nationals. They had three people shoot limited 10. I just don't yeah. see why that even is be included. All the other ones I'm well, I'm for, okay. but that's the only one I have the issue with. If there's so, an L10, so, why is there no Open 10? Why is there no CO10? Why is there no well, PCC 10? It's because it's built into the rules that if you're in that state, uh, that that the capacity is the capacity for that particular match. Well, yes and no. The way that the way that rules applied uh, is not very friendly to the like people who are just getting to the game in capacity limited states and haven't had the chance to build up grandfathered magazines because the, the the way uspsa reads that rule is as long as anyone in that state can legally possess this magazine then uh okay the, you, even if you can't buy it that like at the moment uh, it's, it's mm -hmm. still allowed at least that's the way it's been applied uh, of, of late yeah now if, if okay. it were that's good to know yeah, yeah if, if it were applied in the sense that like the current prevailing capacity limit in the state is the capacity limit for matches in the state. I think that'd be a lot fairer. Um, so how many states are we talking about where that, where that's relevant, where you have to have an L10 because uh, uh, Hawaii for one, and there's yeah. some Eastern Colorado, state. Colorado, even though yes. it's, even though we all know that it's not actually in Colorado, nobody pays attention to that. Yeah. It, well, and it's actually 15 rounds in Colorado. So yeah, we're you can get still not nearly as strict as like yeah. it'd be New York, New Jersey, Hawaii, um, 13 states. Massachusetts capacity limited. Is it 13? Yeah. It's Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, Maryland, <laughs> Delaware, uh, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Vermont. Yeah. Okay. I'm not, but they're not, not all I'm, 10 rounds. Some are 15. That's just magazine yeah, restrictions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, out of the, those 13 states, there's, there's what, 25 of them shooting L10 in, in level threes? Like, why, why are you even worrying about them? In, I, I in the wouldn't. Future? Okay. So, I wouldn't be I'll, I'll answer that yeah. question is put your, put your hat on as a business person. You have someone that wants to shoot your match and hand you money. Why would you turn them away? They can still shoot it. But you're they advocating to get rid match. of the division. Yeah. They can still shoot them. They would be in limited at that point. But why? Uh, but what if they 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 want to shoot that division? They they may understand they're they're not being recognized. What do they hurt? Well, I mean, we could start I, making up divisions for 
well, at every kind of gun out there, but it doesn't not, it doesn't I serve think, Dave, a purpose. Can you, Dave, can you put that chart back up? I think yeah. if, I think if we're um, making um, divisions, there's a there's a different discussion than if correct. Yeah. I think I, it feels like there's yeah. almost a, like two discussions that, that are happening yeah, about. Yeah, my my thoughts are a hybrid reducing. of the two discussions that are going on now. Oh, like there does me, need to think? be a consolidation of divisions into like capacities and uh, challenges, but I also don't believe that minor and major power factor should go away as a dynamic in the sport. I think that's an important dynamic in the sport. So what would you, how would you combine them life? I don't know a hundred percent how I would consolidate them. Exactly. I've heard mm -hmm. a couple people outline how they would, they would do it doing some kind of low cap irons, high cap irons, low cap optics probably wouldn't be a thing in high cap optics. I don't know exactly how it would come together. I don't think there would be a low cap optics, but if you had, um, low cap irons, you would have a differentiation with major and minor, like is in single stack, it would be 10 rounds for minor, eight rounds for major. Um, revolver would fall under that. L10 would fall under that. So now it's not a standalone division taking up space. Um, production would fall under that. So long as they do not move production to 15 rounds, which I think would be a big mistake. Um, I don't think that Why? solves anything for production. I, I don't see I what the real benefit is. I all. agree. Ipsic alignment. That's that's actually yeah, but it's yeah, not. yeah. But if you actually go and ask Ipsic, even they don't know why they do fifteen. It doesn't make any real yeah. any sense anymore. Well, They're like, well, let's just pick a number. Okay, fifteen. Oh, I heard. Good. Let's just go with it. I heard a very convoluted story how Ipsic fell on fifteen recently, and I can't even remember it. It was so convoluted. It had, <laughs> some, it had something to do with limiting. Uh, well, they don't put the production gun in a box. It had something to do with mag length, and people started gaming. Um, base pads and internals and stuff, and it started getting out of control. Mm -hmm. And there maybe wasn't a maximum mag length, and some companies were making like very small production number, really expensive guns that somehow got on the production list that held 21 rounds or something like that. So they finally, through some mechanism, settled on 15. I don't remember exactly all the steps. Now, without going too far in the weeds, I mean, I we'll have people that show up at the the newer matches. And they'll be like, well, what division are you shooting? You're shooting production. Okay, well, do you know what production is? Well, there's only 10 rounds in the gun. And you tell them there's only 10 rounds in the magazine. They're like, why? I mean, for most people, when you tell them this, that when you say the word production, most people who are new and don't understand the dynamics of this game, their, their brain naturally goes to, I just went to Sportsman's Warehouse. I bought this gun. It's a production gun off the shelf. Here's my gun with my two magazines. I want to shoot. And that's, that's where their brain automatically goes. And so if we think about it from that perspective, then what is a production gun? It's an off, it's an off the shelf gun where you fill up the magazines. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I go all the way to fill up the magazines, just again, because that gets to like Leif was saying the, like kind of the manufacturer arms race. Oh, no, I, no, I, yeah. I totally, yes, I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that, but that's, that's kind of the mentality of what the, when I talk to the new, the new people, yeah. that's the mentality that kind of comes across and there, it's a, it's a game, it's a game has rule. I understand that, but that's one of the conversations that often comes up. Yeah. Actually, I see one of the, one of the comments here on the side uh, about Ipsic alignment and I will take, take a moment to stand on, a, on a, another soapbox of mine that I think that's actually kind of an important part of USPSA's job as an organization to go and prove to the world that America makes the best shooters and uh, be, take be that a, Eric or fell. Yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> well, one of these years we'll get you, um, <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, being alive, it's like, it, I think it contributes to that goal because you're using equipment that you could use in international competition, even if not a lot of people do. Right. I agree, Jay. I think that the, the, there, somebody posted the comment that uh, I think it was Tyler Turner. It's, it's irrelevant. I mean, we have a strong enough USPSA here that is 95% of the folks, actually probably higher, way higher than that, state internal USPSA. Yeah. Um, so there, there's some validity to IPSC alignment is, is kind of irrelevant. However, uh, we are a subset of IPSC and... Uh, if we diverge too much, we become a different sport. And I also agree with um, with with Leif or whoever made the comment about you know you you load up your magazines from the gun you just bought. Fifteen is a lot closer to the the capacity than than ten is. We're at a point where carry guns guns you just buy don't they don't have ten round magazines. The single stack uh, guns from the factory are are old. That that is old, 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 old thinking. And there's relatively few states, um, who have those 10 round capacity 
restrictions. And if we're being 100% honest, most of those those folks don't pay attention to them. I shot in California for a year and a half. I saw zero people, zero at matches that had hundreds of people right um, that were following those capacity okay. and and here's you know, but I, there's I don't a, want... there's a huge difference between the individual choosing to ignore a law and the organization putting forth the framework that requires you to ignore law to be it, competitive well it's not a requirement it's not That's it's not absolutely true. not it's, a requirement. it's at, okay but if if we get rid of if if open for instance so if you come from a state where you can only have 10 round mags and it's open 10 and everyone ignores that and you don't have some, some sort of rule to deal with that, then really to be competitive, you're never going to be competitive against an, an open shooter with a 30 round magazine. And isn't you're that, shooting is, a 10 round magazine. Isn't that the same reason that we ultimately created created uh, production and all these other divisions was because originally USPSA had two divisions, uh, limited Correct. and open. Uh, well, long, and then well, one. Long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. And then like they're like, hey, there's this guy that really wants to make it a game called IDPA. And so they went and started that and all of a sudden USPSA lost a chunk of their people and they're like, maybe we should have this have a similar thing called production. And that was yeah. during the middle of the whole magazine ban, so we kept that ten round thing. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I mean but some of these divisions still exist for good reasons, understandably. Yeah, but but you understand what what I'm trying to say. There's a there's a 100%. difference between oh yeah yeah you, an individual yeah. choosing to do things and, and through their own free will uh, that may get them in trouble with the with the local law enforcement, as opposed to an organization that that sets up its members for failure. Right. There or, are like there are things in my just as an example, like in the introduction match. Um, that match is a match in name only. It's a class. It's a way that I help teach people how to play the game. And if we go by the strict letter of the law, and this is why I say that like USPSA and NRI really can't create this. It has to be created at the local level because USPSA has to be very specific. If you do this, you go home. You're DQ'd. But Correct. in that kind of a setting, I can be like, okay, well, this person was running with their finger in the trigger. I can pull them off to the side. I can say, look, this is what I saw in a real match. You're going to have this, this, uh, this, this, this is going to happen because of what you did. So here's how you're going to solve that. It's a yeah. teaching environment. And so, yeah, there's, there's that difference. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And that's, and that's, you bring up a good point there. You know, the, a competitor that DQs their first match, 90% of the time, they don't come back, back. And that's hard. Yeah. They never come back. Um, well, it's also an embarrassment too. You know, your very correct. first match correct. you get, you get DQ'd. You're like, Oh, I just made a fool of myself. Yeah, I get it. So th there's a Canadian shooter I know who who comes into the U.S. and he shoots USPSA matches. And when he when he crosses, you know, they can only have 10, 10 round mags up in Ipsix. He shoots open. So he has 10 round mags and open. When he comes down and shoots our matches, he either drills them out, drills out the, the really? magazine capacity limiters, or he borrows magazines. Um, my, my argument would be, if he's willing to do that, and, and I, it extend. He's an example of, of what I feel like most folks in capacity restricted states are doing, is that we don't USBSA doesn't need to require that. Those folks in that state, what they do is their decision. If they sure. shoot a match in another state, there is ample opportunity to become competitive. One, most of them are either going to have grandfather magazines or they're going to. They're just going to do what they're going to do. Or three, they're going to have uh, the opportunity to, to get that equipment that makes them competitive. I mean, we're I'm talking like 90, 95% of those folks. It, it is very, very easy as soon as they cross the state lines to become competitive uh, in USPSA without the capacity restrictions. Scott, was this the graphic you wanted or did you want the other one, the Area 7 one? Well, it was the Area 7 one. And the point I was going to make is, you know, if you get rid of L10, what what is that three more shooters in any other division? Is that going to be a statistically difference? It's not. Yeah, I mean, so from from my perspective, there's kind of a hidden premise in arguments about division size that doesn't get said out loud a lot, and that is that uh, 
you know, the, the idea behind it is I, I like to shoot against a lot of people. And that's not necessarily, I mean, that's, I, I do. I like to shoot against a lot of people when right. I have the chance. Right. But, um, because but you don't want that, a participation trophy. Well, exactly. But I, but given the choice between shooting something I don't like shooting as much and shooting something I do like as much, I'll choose shooting what I do like as much, even if there's not a lot of, not a lot of people to shoot against. It, it kind of gets more like I'm playing a round of golf in that case, or I'm, I'm trying to better myself. And that's the progress. That's, that's the rubric I measure myself by. But, uh, but yeah, so the that that is like kind of my my central objection to the uh, division should be big argument, and that I think that's not necessarily something that uh, that doesn't stand on itself. That's not facially true. Mm. And that kind of comes back to the conversation of bringing production to fifteen rounds. Does anybody really think a year or two from now, if that change was made, that production is going to get bigger participation numbers? No, production's not dead. I hate to say it. it. No, so it's it's kind of it, it will it. it will stymie some of the decline, but that's it. It will that's slow the, the decline way, a that little is the bit. Best way of saying it, hundred percent. Yeah, I, it's, yeah. I, I, if, it hurts to say that, but. I mean, because a lot of people came in shooting production, and a lot of us thought that we were going to die shooting production. I still love shooting production. I, I'm a low cap shooter at heart. Yeah. So this this and all yeah. I agree with everything everyone's saying about the decline and optics taking over. It hurts my soul, but mm -hmm. I know it's true. But I, I'm shooting single stack major right now through Ipsic Nationals, and then I'll go back to production through the spring. That's just yeah. what I enjoy doing. I like yeah. that aspect of the game. And I think that's why you game. that's why you can't take it away from people because, I mean, the idea of ta of taking something away from the shooters, I mean, it's like, well, let's go actually talk to the revolver shooters. Let's talk to the single stack shooters and the production guys. What is it that they want to see? I mean, like we put out these like these equipment surveys and these like, you know, what should we do with this division? Well, of all the people that actually respond, I mean, how many of them are still actively shooting the thing? I mean, are they shooting this thing because they just love production? They love they love the, how mental production is and single stack like you actually have to be a thinking man to shoot some of these divisions the stages are uniquely challenging in their own way and it's like well people like to do that for that reason and should we t should we take that away is a question that's always worth asking but at the end of the day we still have to come back to the people who are actively shooting and say do you want to keep shooting this thing even if we don't recognize it is it still something that you want robert and that's a really think, good point I, about I, I, Sorry, I, I think the only reason that uh, production numbers will go up if it goes to 15 is you're going to rob uh, a section of that limited minor shooters right. away. Yeah. I do think that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, the, so the, the limited minor shooter coming to his first match or two is no more likely to win limited than the production shooter shooting production 15 the first match or two is, going, is likely to, provided there's competition in both those divisions. Yeah. But it, it feels more fair. You know, you, you come in with your with your Glock 17 and 15 rounds in the magazine. You feel better about that than you feel better about shooting against the guy with the shadow two, which at least looks kind of like your gun as opposed to the guy with the big slab sided yeah. 2011 and the <laughs> big sticks. And but the, I, but you, I think you could say the same thing about limited optics and open for a new shooter, though. Yeah. Like before there was limited optics, they would just come in and sh they would shoot open. They were not in any contention to win open, but they had a place to shoot. Yeah, that's just the, the new market. guys don't care. They, no. they, func they just don't care. Yeah. Well, and I think we're we're missing the point that we are forgetting the point that we talked about earlier that the new guy isn't showing up with iron sight gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah very, well, some do, but very few. You very know, what's few. actually really funny yeah. is we are seeing, and I I don't understand what is causing this. I don't know if people are just watching like YouTube and stuff like that, but we're seeing uh, brand new shooters show up and they have like seriously kitted out equipment like staccatos and uh like like full race gear uh, holsters and stuff and i'm just like how much it's money the did you drop it's the t-rex arms effect yeah it's it's crazy and i'm just like i am so glad that you're like you know all gung-ho into doing this before you've ever shot a match before but wow, well you have more yeah, money youtube at youtube and instagram have been uh, insane in the last five years for getting uspsa style shooting out to the regular shooter. Yeah. I saw an advertisement for, um, I can't remember the name of the company, but they're doing some very kind of innovative, uh, basically bringing competition style manipulation to, um, the tactical shooter. So they, they've created this thing where it's called the wing. And it, once you draw your weapon out of the, of a retention holster, it flips down from your, mm -hmm. from your weapon mounted flashlight. And now you've got a thumb rest and it's, it's literally a ledge. Um, 
that and and that's it's it's a it's an open gun it's it's a thumb right. rest from an open gun and now you can use it on your your tactical holster and and your your everyday carry or whatever it is um i'm sure that, that will never break no of course not <laughs> yeah well i mean but the fact that it's coming it's coming from uspsa it's huge i mean we sometimes we forget how monumental in in progressing firearm shooting that our sport oh, is 100 yeah. percent. you are so right about that i mean it's the funniest thing uspsa in terms of member participation by when compared to gun owners across america i mean there are so many decimal points before you even get to us but in terms of moving the technological needle and actually proving out equipment and making sure that it works everybody in the gun industry fundamentally has to thank USPSA and production or excuse me, uh, practical shooting for making equipment work because nobody tests it in the way that practical shooting does. It's really a manifestation, you know, these 40 plus years later since the founding of IPSC in 1976, that that that's in the founding documents of, of, of IPSC, yeah. uh, that, you know, it was to test equipment and techniques um, that people wanted to prove and, and, and see what works and what doesn't work. And that has absolutely been fulfilled through the mission of USPSA. And we definitely know that the leather holsters aren't as good. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> oh man. I all rode somebody at an indoor match on Friday night that was running a 1911 and a leather holster and it scared the crap out of me every uh -huh. time I would reholster that yeah. gun because it kept collapsing on him and he kept like pointing the gun at his hip to try to open the holster back up. It was not yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Oh my so God. I got, I got a, I got a point to that where I, I kind of, Jay, I, I disagree with you a little bit in that having the larger divisions is, is, is a little bit better because I think the majority of the innovation comes out of the larger, highly competitive divisions. Um, and if we start looking like steel challenge, um, it, it loses its appeal when you go to a local match and you're only competing against three or four people. Look at look at well, see, folks again, who that that right there. That's that's the difference in opinion that it comes down to it. Uh, okay. Again, yeah, I'd, I'd rather yeah. I'd rather that's shoot a matter of perspective. Two or three people than carry yeah. optics against forty. Well, Just... but that's and there's folks like you who are going to shoot what they want to shoot. That's fine. Uh, and and actually, you know, I've got I've got written down here where I think USPSA will be uh, in five years or kind of where my proposal would be in five years and don't worry, we're going to keep revolver where it's at, but, <laughs> um, that's all I mean. Everything else is fine. Do, yeah. do whatever you want. Otherwise <laughs> burn the rest of them. Just leave me alone. <laughs> but if you look at folks, um, it, I mean, honestly, it's really like anybody who's kind of a class and below, they compare themselves to all the other divisions or, or they're, they're like, yes, I scored, I finished, you know, three out of 10 in a class. And then overall, and it's like, if we start reducing that denominator and it's like three out of four, three out of three, you know, it, to me, that's pretty demoralizing to some of those shooters who are trying to work their way up and become more competitive. I think having those larger denominators, having a, you know, approximately six, seven divisions, um, where, where folks are, are playing is, is the right number. I mean, so if, if I were building, so I guess I've got kind of two things there. If I were king for a day and could combine whatever I wanted, I think I'd probably end up with something like a, like a 10, 10 minor, eight major low cap division, because that, that's actually an interesting choice from like a game perspective, given our eight round per array limit. Uh, and I'd probably end up with a, I don't know, just I, I kind of like the the contrast between say a limited op a limited mm -hmm. optics and a production optics uh, as opposed to carry optics and carry optics plus like we have now. Um, oh, hundred percent agree with you yeah. on that one. I mean, but, there there has to be a differentiation right now. Yeah, they're they're the same division plus uh, plus a magwell and and a single action trigger. Yeah. Um, but, so what would be sorry, your what would be your distinguisher? So go go back to where CO used to be. Reduce the weight. Um, Personally, I'd like to see it at 15 round magazines. Uh, although the big, the biggest thing for me is the, uh, is the weight. And then also I wouldn't mind getting rid of these massive thumb rests, which I have one on my shadow too. It's a limited gun. The thing is absurd. It's sticking out the, uh, out the side. Like, I mean, it's a whole massive thing. Yeah. 
No, I, so, I kind of like I kind of like the production optics box with the optic cutout. That's kind of yes, cool absolutely, one. yeah, absolutely. So a box setup is is something that I'd, I'd, I'd advocate for for sure. But again, that's it's not really a division I shoot, so I'll leave the discussion about that to um, to people who do. Um, the the point I was the point I was getting at is that if I were doing a rule book for a practical shooting sport, clean sheet without history behind it, I think it'd look different from USPSA almost certainly. But also something very valuable that we have in uh, our particular sport is its history. I mean, we've been around for a long time as uh, like on, on the, the time. 40 years before. next year. Yeah. yeah. 40 years and 24. Wow. It's like, mm-hmm. and uh, okay. I, I, I'm reticent to lose too much of that by realigning things too drastically. Well, I mean, you could say that, but at the same time, there was only one division for quite a while. Well, for, for some of that time. Yeah. Right. For the first well, 16 years, there were only two. Okay, but there was yeah. so, there wasn't any real the, competition at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Was, I, yeah. I'm just saying, if we were to get rid of limited ten, we're not we're not changing the history a whole lot. Is all I'm saying. I, I wouldn't be terribly sad if limited ten were to go away. But again, I say I'm not one of the people who shoots limited ten. But given but, given uh, nationals numbers, not many people do. Not many people choose to shoot limited ten when there are alternatives that are kind of similar. So. Right. Were you going to say, Scott? No, nothing. Okay. So, mm-hmm. our, I guess now is a good time for me to throw out where I think where I think it's it's going to be in in five yeah, years. Yeah, let's do it. We're at we're at twenty one percent. I think if I did my math correct, Dave, of folks right now who are shooting irons, I think in in five years that's going to be below ten percent. Um, I think the folks that are hanging on at that point are the diehard iron shooter, uh, which is nothing wrong. I think. Iron iron sights are not going to go away anytime in the foreseeable future. Uh, there will always be an iron sights division. However, when we start talking about less than ten percent of the sport shooting iron sights, um, what does that look like? So for me, what I wrote down is one Revo gets its own division because there's just no way to compare it to um, the other types of of handguns. It's, it's mechanically so different. Yes. You're welcome, Jay. Thought about you during this. Um, and then from there, you know, I know Jay's probably going to disagree with this, but what I think the the best way to kind of consolidate, because I, I am an advocate for slightly larger groups. Um, again, if you're coming in and you're not super competitive, then you don't really care, uh, about whether you don't have the most competitive handgun it is to make, basically do a, a new box that will fit uh, production handguns, um, 1911s, 2011s, um, with 15 round magazines and all shoot fire. I think by doing that, you can make most of your handguns relatively competitive. Uh, if you remove the, the thumb rests, the giant mag wells. So we're going to kind of the more the tactical or EDC style mag wells, um, things like that get rid of 40 because again besides the diehard and even the folks who are diehard uh limited or single stack major shooters the the ones i've talked to they don't like 40 it's the they only load it and shoot it because they have to to be competitive competitive, you have to yeah Yeah. and and i think we'll see that that's going to get even harder in the next few years uh 40 brass is getting harder and harder to get and when you have to start, have the choice between uh, buying factory ammo and and shooting minor, you're going to shoot minor. I got twenty. I got twenty gallons of forty under that table. I mean, if anybody needs some, hit me up. <laughs> Is that free shipping? Yeah, but <laughs> maybe. You, you say that sounds like a lot, but a, but an, an active competitive shooter that trains, they'll go oh, through that in 100%, a year. Percent. Hundred percent. Oh yeah. Now that's one year supply. No, it, I mean, 40, 40 is, is tough. I mean, when the FBI said we're done with it, I mean, the sole reason for its existence kind of went out the window. But if you take that step, then should we be getting rid of 38 Super? Because it's used even less. It's open, though. It's major power factor, so. I mean, to, to some I, I don't degree, want to think- touch open. I love open. It's, 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 that open is where the fun things happen. Everybody wants to shoot open. They just can't afford it. I, uh, I I kind of agree with that, honestly. Um, I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm always a fan of the like the the auto racing metaphors for this sort of thing. You've got your open, your your, your formula cars, your uh, finicky things that 
don't last super long, expensive to run, but <laughs> man, they go fast. Uh, you've got like your big V8 limited guns, uh, kind of your, your stock car racers. And I always like the limited guys I see are always like bigger too, like the, the competitive ones. <laughs> Case, I, I guess I would agree with you, but I would say we're already there. In what I, regard? I, what do you mean? As far as the the iron sided divisions being ten percent of the sport, I, I think we're already there. It's already the the diehards, or or the brand new person that shoots one two matches and then goes to something else, and it's typically carry optics. Uh, I think we're there. I don't think it's going to go a lot lower than it is right now. I think I think yeah. limited is probably going to end up. In its in its final form, a little bit bigger than the, uh, the like the low cap iron division. Just again because uh, it's uh, it's a dollars per unit speed thing. And I think you're going to see open die. I really? think limited optics is going to is going to ta- is going to start taking out uh, open. Not not with not with no comp and um, no. With the, I mean, that's a lot of the numbers are coming out of. Seems to be. I mean, it's it's look anecdotal evidence of one, right? Yeah. But it's 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 hard it's hard to know until you start seeing more and more actually start pushing one way or the other. But um, the limited optics. I mean, you're see you're seeing the people that that are switching over from carry optics, but um, by and large, a carry optic and a limited optic gun they're so darn similar. I mean, a shadow yeah. two. Once you overcome that double action. Uh, those, those triggers are pretty darn good. And heck, let's be honest. I mean, even a lot of these like plastic uh, carry optic guns, they've got triggers on those things that are really quite amazing. Uh, They'll never be as good as Super Tune Twenty Eleven. I know that. I don't know. I run an MP competitor metal uh, trigger. Yeah. I mean, so, so who's who's for advoc- who who in here? Does anybody agree that they're good where they're at? Or I I don't know anybody. Who says tell tell me at. tell me what you mean. Like Good CO and, and LO. Like I either get two arguments. One, combine them, or two, we need to separate them. And separate. my argument would be separate them because if you mm-hmm. combine them, here's what happens. Staccato wins. Um, <laughs> they're, they're, yeah. Whatever their their uh, their advocacy in the USB I'm still picking board. Mills and his canic. Yeah, well, that's fair. <laughs> but they – so but not everyone's a nils. natural tendency yeah. – I know. natural tendency when you're shooting in a division, if you're semi-competitive, is to go towards – if you have the option to shoot a 2011 versus not, you're going to shoot it. Nobody nobody who's competitive and open is shooting anything other than a 2011, um, maybe with very, very, very few. What's Grafell shooting? He's shooting a CZ, but he's not shooting open anymore. And he's also paid by them a lot of money, so he's going to. I know. Them. I just. I was just. Yeah. I was okay. just teasing <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. How about how about this case? So when you when to to drive your point home a little bit, if you are a B, a, a low A, a B, a C, or a D shooter, you will see an improvement in your scores by buying equipment uh, when you're going, especially going from a striker fire to a single action gun. If no, you are a but, mid A or above, you, you, the equipment is, is much less of an impact on your score. I disagree. So I, I think for almost everybody, really? the yeah. the improvement in equipment, unless you're talking about reliability, is almost negligible. Mm. It almost actually, negligible. So was, I can shoot. I can shoot a, a shadow two if probably within one or two percent of how well I would shoot a twenty eleven. And what's your um, highest? What's your highest classification? Grandmaster. Right. So you're you're the example of my point. Once you get above that mid mid range A or upper A, equipment doesn't matter. Well, so, but I've been there. D, I've been that C, C B. I've been that C or B shooter. Those folks who are upgrading are upgrading because they think that equipment is going to make them significantly better. It's not. Well, and, it is, and, it's I, and I would that argue point. that if you think it's going to make you better, it will. So. Uh, I mean, there, actually, it's probably probably a little bit of both, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think there, there I mean, is there, a point at which it does make a difference, though. Otherwise, we. I mean, it is. In the first place. I mean, if, if, <laughs> if look, if a, if a heavy gun didn't have any advantage, nobody would be running them. I mean, if a yeah, hammer yeah. fired gun didn't have any advantage, then uh, we wouldn't be using them. There, there's Correct. advantages to equipment. Now, how much that advantage actually plays out in the scheme of things, uh, that's that's a great debate. I'm not smart enough to understand all that, but it is it's a debate worth having. Yeah. So, 
I've got some uh, some thoughts on on this very thing with respect to gear and skill. Um, done a fair amount of pondering on the subject, and even you know gathering a little bit of limited data, at least particularly from like students of mine and whatnot. But uh, I actually put out a, a post on my social medias a couple months ago, and I, I talked about this very issue, and I basically described it on a like a standard uh, bell curve where. You know, the lower skilled shooters, the equipment basically doesn't matter because lower skill is lower skill, mostly because the person isn't consistent enough to deliver, you know, whatever that skill is time in and time in, time out again. Um, and so with lower skilled shooters, I, and I would honestly say like with like C and D class shooters, equipment almost doesn't matter because the skill level is just not there enough for it to, to be a huge factor. I think the middle, like your middle, like standard uh, deviation, like one standard deviation is where equipment probably matters the most because then I'm in agreement with Scott that you get above probably, yeah, mid A class, certainly in the master class, uh, equipment starts to matter less. So that's, yeah. that's I, I really think it's about that middle is where it, it the kind of rubber meets the road as far as people seeing benefits realized from equipment. Like a, like a bell curve kind of thing or something? Well, I don't know. I'm, I think I agree with, uh, in, in the comments here, our, our guy Tanfo Timmy. Um, in the, like there, for, for me, the, uh, the difference between, like better gear is more tolerant of mistakes. Um, it's, it's much easier to shoot a heavy gun with a light trigger. Well, it masks, it yeah. masks fundamental issues. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, that's exactly why, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I'm not but blind one, to that, and, I, and that's why I do advocate for the separation. But when they're together, so close, yeah, you know, it, that's where I, I have an issue. Do have to get um, back to the, the CEO because, think, yeah. like, look at like it, yeah. I mean, the guys that we had at the top uh, of LO, we had two 2011s and then and then a a striker fired gun. Yeah. yeah, we had a 320. Um, and it, granted, he wasn't that close, but he also wasn't practicing at all prior to the match. So. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, given the money, I buy a 2011 over my Shadow 2 and LO every day, every day, and then twice on Sunday. So, uh, but my my problem herein lies that the tendency should we should have divisions where the tendency is not that you need to feel the obligation to upgrade and spend that money on a very specific platform because. Right. The way I look at it is, you know, 2011s are a very small segment of the overall handgun market in general. I carry a striker fired gun. You know, I, there is a lot of prevalence and need for guns that are not 2011s um, to be proficient with, to be competed with. Um, I like the idea of having a, a division where we can separate those two a little bit. And, and if, if it's but, just, if it's, if the only difference is single action, that's not enough of a difference. I'm gonna, I'm just going to eventually go to 2011. So are all the new shooters. But through that, through that separation and consolidating divisions, like putting your, your single stacks and all those things into the same division, are you essentially forcing people into one gun? Yeah. So I've, I, I have thought about that because, um, if we're talking about 10% for shooting, shooting irons in five years from now. Sure. Um, my argument with that at that point would be the remaining folks are going to sh probably shoot whatever it is that they are confident with and they want to shoot. You've got the diehards with whatever their platform is. Um, I, this is a little bit of an assumption on my part, um, but I, I just think you're going to be so narrow at that point with Somebody wants to shoot a 201140. Somebody wants to shoot a, uh, you know, Glock or whatever in production. Like it, it there's just going to be nobody to compete against. So if you can consolidate them and at least get that box in those parameters where that they're relatively competitive to each other, then we might actually see some competition between the different platforms. So, so let me let me ask you a question on that. Um, in um, in the late 90s. There, there was there was a conversation had that there was concern because that a person who got in if a brand new person who gets into USPSA uh, would be so behind the power curve in terms of showing up to a match and this this idea that well 
all the people here are shooting these uh, single actions or these double action or these single actions or the 2011 style guns. And when they actually start to look at the cost of that, and they're like, okay, that's far beyond what I can do, and I'm not I'm not going to put that money into the given. And so how do you how do you make the case that by um, consolidating these visions that we're not fundamentally just going right back to what we tried in what was functionally the late nineties only to find that it was a failed idea because there was still a group of people that are, were like, okay, well, we don't actually have a home here anymore. And so now we're going to go try this other game called IDPA. And it ultimately kind of hurt USPSA to the point of like something like 25% of their membership or something like that. How do you make the case against that? I think all, I mean, I think all the folks that are in that boat are going to be playing in uh, optics divisions anyways. I mean, the, the 10% we're talking about at that point are either the old diehards or the, the existing diehards. Nobody coming into the sport in five years is going to be wanting to shoot irons and stay in irons. At least not at first. I mean, I, I ended up getting to revolver. I, I went via carry optics. So interesting. Okay. So Jay, so what about add, I don't think this is going to make a difference at all in terms of revolver participation. However, what are your thoughts on adding optics to revolver? I shot some of it this year and it was fun. Uh, as a relatively young guy, purely selfishly, I want to keep iron sets till my eyes start to go. <laughs> then, uh, then we could do whatever. Fair but, enough. But, you know, it's a, I'm gonna uh, leave that to your decision. Yeah, I don't really I mean, care. I just optic optic roller is fun. It's, uh, it's it's a little more fun than iron revolver, maybe even. So what Before if we, we talk, what if we with L, I mean speaking of L10, just, I had a thought that that somebody had talked about. I mean, if we what if you keep L10, but you but you put, allow them to put optics on it and allow it to become more of an experimental division. I really like that idea. I would have been totally on board with the, the limited 10 meta being a free mounted 10 round 40 caliber pistol, because that's just so delightfully bonkers. And it's, but, it, <laughs> but it, and in that, I mean, it becomes a very unique division in and of itself yeah. because it's functionally a single, it's functionally um, a low cap 2011 or single stack uh, gun, but it now has, it now has a very unique skill set, and it's arguably a lot more unique than carry optics, limited optics in that regard. I think if we did that, all the uh, dot manufacturers better send us a Christmas card because, man, <laughs> uh, probably so. <laughs> because you're a, a forty, a slide ride forty with a with a any dot, you're, you're just going to destroy them. I mean, the, yeah, the, the warranty recoil impulse, impulse would change real quick. Yeah, the uh, the recoil impulse on a forty is so much different than a nine that you, you're just going to destroy dots that's true but i i know i happen to know of this uh this game that people play a lot that uh tends to prove out equipment over the course of a lot of destructive sure. matches <laughs> sure yeah and I've, I've got a local guy that that has the uh, the the sega warranty department on uh speed dial on speed dial <laughs> and he, he waits until he sends uh five jokes, Romeo jokes on him because the they time. uh they've blocked his call by now <laughs> oh man I, I last i talked to him he was up to i think over 20 returns wow Wow, that that, that, at, should, that, that at should that five should be at a time. Sign. At five at a time, Jiminy Christmas. Holy wow. cow! I, yeah, I've run five those, at a time. I've run those maxes for several years now, and I haven't had near that bad of luck. <laughs> yeah, he runs them on a three twenty. He shoots a lot. I mean, he 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 shoots a lot, but 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 forty cal. No, no, it's it's a no. Oh, oh, yikes. Okay. It's a great warranty, though. Yeah, you just send it back. <laughs> I mean, the guy's replaced 20. It's got to be a pretty good warranty. 100. Yeah. Before we get too far off the uh, conversation of the differentiation between CO and LO, maybe this is not a big deal, but for some reason it sticks in my head. Just that we don't have good participation data for LO right now because it's being True. kind of diluted with people that are just shooting CO in LO. Like. Yeah. I've talked to numerous people about the equipment survey at handgun nationals because I filled out the uh, single sack survey. So I didn't see the yellow survey, but nobody remembers there being a question on that survey saying, did you shoot your CO gear in LO at nationals? Did you just shoot CO <laughs> nationals again? Because just yeah, I did me. Yeah. What's that? Yep. You shot with the Magwell. Yep. <laughs> well, yep. even without Shout a two Magwell. With the Magwell. But even without a Magwell, I saw a ton of people at handgun nationals walking around with CO guns. They they yep. just wanted another shot at nationals with their CO Agreed. gear. 
And it's the same thing with local match participation data. They're probably shooting CO guns, just getting classified in LO. So we just don't have good data right now. Dude, that's that's that. a and hard I'm, one. That's it is a hard one. one. And I'm not saying LO isn't the future or whatever, but right now I, we just don't know. Well, that's the thing is because limited optics was built for 2011s. If, if yes. you don't have a 2011, then you're just going to shoot CO for the most part. Um, unless you want to bolt on all that extra weight. And then, then like you said, it's, it's a CO gun with a magwell. So that's why I really think we got to differentiate. And there's a lot of people buying LO guns with optics on them. Well, um, the price point of the, of a 2011 has come down so much over the yes. years of getting a quality one, not the best, but a quality 2011 is not so far outside the realms of possibility for a lot of people. MPA is huge with mm-hmm. that. Uh, Bull armor works now. Yep. Yeah, I mean it's a lot. It's it's half the price of what it was five years ago to get into 100%. to get into a good twenty eleven. So, does anybody see any of the other divisions taking a major hit? Like, I, I my whole thing would be I would just do away with limited ten because there's just because there's so little participation, it's crazy. But make CO and LO their own divisions keep eight divisions across the board and go there. But I mean, does anybody else say anything crazy different from that? I think before you get rid of L10, I would probably experiment with it and see and let it and see what you could do with it. Maybe not a slide ride, maybe not a slide ride, maybe make it a frame out, but just throw ideas out there and see, and see if you can, and if you can make uh, L10 something that's unique and different enough that people would want to give a go with it and just, do it as a what is it? What do you guys call it, Scott? When it, when you just do experimental divisions or whatever, it's the, what L ten or uh, limited provisional. provisional. Yeah, make it just provisional for the fun of it. Say, so, I mean, like, hey, we're going to run this thing for a while. Let's see if people like it, and if they do, and if it takes off, well, then fantastic. If not, then we have a but rule so, set that solves it. So, so you're right, talking L ten with a dot? Just a thought. I it's it's things that I think about that kept me out of the good schools. Yeah. Provisional, yeah. How, provisional, is, like, how is how is that how is L ten with a dot any different than open ten? No comp. There's no comp on it. <laughs> well, right. Yeah. But... Uh, that's a great that's a great question. You're gonna get like the the one percent of the sport who has absolutely zero budget and, and they might buy it. But if anybody asked me, I'd be like Hell no, stay away from that because it's going to be relevant in a year. That there's sure. no way that would be successful. Sure, no, but I, I, I understand know. your your where you're going. Like uh, allow it to kind of develop a little bit. I don't know. I, we, we've got plenty. Of I don't know. That are yeah. I don't know right if now, it's though. the answer. Honestly, I really don't. It's just just weird stuff that sometimes I think about that comes out of my mouth too fast. I think Tyler well, has I a do. good point. Yeah, uh, people yeah. compete, not guns. That is true. Yeah. And that, that's how I look at it when I'm shooting single stack major or local matches. I'm seeing what my overall percentage of the high open GM is in the match. You're, you have to set your own bar what, what your metric of success is. It's not, Correct. I shot against one other single stack shooter in the match. So it's not that. That's not the metric for success. So, You're competing so maybe, with people. Maybe our division should be designed such that whatever you show up with, you can be reasonably competitive competitive somewhere i think i like that goal um I, I, so beyond the idea that division should separate but the competitors and division should be separated by scale not gear i like the idea that division should cover a pretty broad spectrum of the handguns you might walk up to a match with yeah correct. yeah i do i've got some numbers oh. on limited optics versus carry optics in western pennsylvania and what, what it boils down to okay. is of 60, 66 people who shot, like 66 unique people who shot limited optics uh, this year at local matches in my section, 36 of them uh, also shot carry optics. A little bit more, a little bit more than half are carry optics and limited optics kind of dual classing. Yeah. So there were really 30 unique limited optics shooters. Yeah. And those might be from other divisions too. I just, I've only got a good way to compare uh, carry optics and limited okay. optics right now. So that, that, that could be some of the, some of the poaching from open too. Okay. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, That's that's not surprising at all. Uh, Honestly, um, if, and and I'm one of those people that got into the sport through carry optics uh, back in 2020 is my first year in USPSA. And 
And that, that's, I was a diehard carry optic shooter for two years uh, saying that, that that was my game. That's the game I was going to play. Uh, I shot production for the first time in 2022. And it was initially because the nationals was going to be a lot closer to my home. And I'm like, I might as well go. What am I going to shoot? Well, I'm going to take the optic off my carry optics gun and I'm going to go shoot in production division at nationals. Nationals was moved. I said, what the heck? Let's go, let's go to Alabama and shoot nationals in production division anyway. I found out I actually quite enjoy that game. It's a totally different game than what I was doing in carry optics. And I found a great deal of satisfaction in shooting it. I don't consider it to be my main division. Um, but uh, but I've, I've enjoyed shooting production, which is what I'm shooting at, at Ipsic Nationals next week. Um, and uh, so it doesn't surprise me at all, though, that, you know, if you have an, a limited optics division and a care optics division that are honestly pretty similar equipment wise, meaning that I can just easily run my care optics gun in, in LO, then, of course, I'm going to participate in LO. And that's probably what I would have done if I hadn't already sort of discovered this new love for production. In the, you know, in the process of the last year or so. Um, so I, I'm in agreement that um, if LO is going to be a thing, then, and I would not have said this a year and a half ago, because I was all like, hey, I like carry optics the way it is. It's what got me into the game. I like the high capacity slide ride optic, relatively affordable aspect of it. Um, it's a fun way to basically play similar cheap open. And, uh, uh, but now with LO being in the mix, I'm of the opinion that carry optics probably ought to be di- differentiated a bit more from LO. Um, and so a lot of things like what Case was saying earlier about, hey, look, we could go to 15 round capacity. Uh, we could get rid of, you know, some of this stuff with, uh, you know, all these different little thumb rests and things that, you know, and other contraptions people are coming out that are, you know, legal in, in carry optics and just make it di- different enough from LO well, that we see a bit more separation well here's a question i mean everybody's talking about like uh, taking away from carry optics why don't you just limit limited optics i mean i mean if, if you're trying to make all make this di- differentiation and everything why don't you just make why don't you make limited optics only 15 rounds and limited optics only ha- have a certain weight and limited optics not have things why are you trying to take away from an existing division to prop up another division it's just a matter of naming really i think Probably uh, right. I mean, that, yeah, I mean, on, really, fundamentally, that's kind of it. Yeah. Honestly, I was I was a fan of like when LO was first being discussed. I was a fan of the idea of let's take limited ten and kind of make that the LO division, um, and and kind of keep some things similar to you know L ten, maybe even the limited capacity aspect, but put a slide right optic on it. You know, I, I that. Because I thought that that could be a, a unique way of sure. letting L10 die the death that it's already died um, and replacing it with something that, you know, would get people interested again in, in something a little bit different and unique from everything else. Um, but- Ten rounds isn't fun. <laughs> I used to uh, think I'm, I'm serious. Like- Ten rounds isn't fun. I, bet, I don't. I, I I can't go that with you, Scott. I'm with like ten rounds like is it. actually that it's a different production. Game. It's a very different game, and it's yeah. very okay. cerebral. And if you like it's, that style of game, I wouldn't call myself cerebral for the record. But it's. <laughs> <laughs> but but let's be honest. Production has changed from its origins of hey, this is the the quasi stock gun that that you can go and pick up at the sportsman's warehouse to hey, this is hard mode in USPSA. Well, right. I think because some of, some you, of you have to yeah, you some have of that to... because of what carry optics did though in the in terms of like they went and instead of actually designing quality stages where um, there we go uh, yeah. well, a shooter could actually... <laughs> no i understand it, that but I, I think, i've been trying I think... to fit this go ahead, in here Leif. no go for it go for it I'll no i i sometimes sometimes i think one of the big one of the biggest challenges is shooting low cap in any whether it's single stack or production is just that the stages have all now been designed by the people who are shooting the division they launch. And we talked about this. We set stages up that we want it, that we want to practice. Correct. And I get that. Correct. But at the same time, has that caused us to then be like, well, you know, I am really, I have a really hard time with shooting my dot out at 25 yards. And so maybe um, I'm going to go and stick these like, uh, tuxedos out at 25 yards. Cause that's hard for a, a carry optic shooter. But when I first started, doing matches, um, one of the best pieces of advice somebody ever gave me is this, if you design a stage to slow down a GM or an M, you will crush the B, C, and Ds. 
And, yep. uh, and I think we've built these stages and we've changed this, this world to basically cater towards carry optics and open guns, which is fun, but it kind of made it not really fun for production because it just was overly punitive. Right. I heard handgun and options think, was super exciting. And, and I think we <laughs> saw that when PCC first Ooh. came out. You start. To, you saw for a while the stages really changed, and there, yeah. there was everything was made to be hard for the rifle, uh, and it, it was really discouraging. And then now, now we've reeled that back in a little bit. Um, but I think you have a good point. There's, there's a problem with stage design. Um, you know, how do we? Uh, you know, I mean, we've talked a lot about divisions. How, how do we? You know, we, we've all been to level twos and level threes. How do we broaden this sport to make it more mainstream? Get rid of the okay. USPSA I, targets. Yeah, that's sorry. Step one. I mean, I, I'd be honest <laughs> with you. Sorry, that's that's really what you have to do. Correct. Well, and you know, the, so one of the the things that I've gotten feedback is is one the area three we had uh, all IPSC targets except for one stage, and that that one had many USPSA targets, which uh, people really loved and we went through a mountain of target sticks um, <laughs> yeah, um, somebody needs to design a specialty target stick just for those minis because yeah you're gonna lose a lot of money going through those things yeah uh i think we started with 48 sticks and had to cut some more by the end of the weekend <laughs> wow uh, that that was beyond what was initially to set the stage up oh mr fix it loved you uh, actually, I had good good or staff there. They did it themselves. Um, <laughs> but anyway, back to one of the things that, that I that I have requested in, into the rules committee is the ability to change the target color. Ooh. I mean, there is there is a lot of social connotations to black, brown, white, and <laughs> have an option yeah. other than black, brown, white. Um, because in the current rule book, you're you're scoring four score targets must be cardboard colored. There is no option. There is nothing, you know, how, how do we get, how do we look forward and how do we get a, a, a Bud Light or a Budweiser or, or someone as a, as a match sponsor and the IPSC target, I, I think they're whoever designed that we need to give them a lot of credit because it yeah. does a good job, not looking like a, uh, a tactical target while still being, uh, a tactical target. Mm -hmm. Scott, you're hundred percent correct. Uh, Georgia state, uh, section match has been doing this for a, a long time. I want to say back in 2014 or 2015, I shot the Georgia state match and they had all IPSC targets at that time. And their rationale was we're trying to make sure that we're not using humanoid, humanoid targets so that we can expand potential sponsorships. Okay. Um, and I, I just don't think there's an, any advantage in our sport to using a hum, humanoid target. The headshot box potentially can add a little bit of interesting shooting challenge. Um, we, we can replicate that in other ways. I don't think we're losing anything by, by getting yeah, rid of the humanoid target. Um, and then as your point, the, the, the black, brown, white, I mean, it's a joke. It's a joke when, when you walk around at USPSA matches, it's like, it oh is. yeah, I shot the white guy. You know, you can't shoot the white guy. You can shoot the brown guy. Um, it, it sounds terrible, but and, and that's just, and nobody means bad by it, but that's because of what the targets are. We, we do have to get to that point where uh, we can we can make them whatever we color we want. And you guys did a great job at Area 3 with, um, you're always changing the color of the, the steel targets, making them weird, weird stuff. But it's, it's interesting. It, it adds a different a element. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Oh, you got like, a good deal on yeah. some yellow paint, huh? Uh, no, <laughs> no. I, I actually, from a from a consistency standpoint, I like to be able to say if it is a, if it's colored white in the match, it's a penalty target. Hmm. Yeah, I love yellow steel. So, so I, th I think you get you do get away a little bit from the uh, like the the white brown black connotations when they're not silhouette targets. You do agreed. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. yeah. You do, and, like, and I, you know, I, th I think there's there's something to it. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure brown is just the cheapest color to make. Well, I mean, histor out of. historically, I mean, if you look at me historically, I mean, what did we get? What did we get targets from? Cardboard. What was yeah. cardboard? It was brown. That's just yeah. what it was. Yeah. No, and right. so, do we have to still be there today? I would say no. 
No. I mean, there's a lot of great targets. I mean, is there, I mean, honestly, have you ever flipped over a USPSA target and shot the white parts? It's a whole lot easier to work with. I mean, the, the target, I mean, it's much easier to score. It's actually pretty, a pretty great way to actually practice, but it's just and not. Now, and now it, the perfs can go all the way through and a lot of them, a lot of the new manufacturer targets do. Yeah. yeah. So My, I, I totally hear what's being you know put out there. I think talking about other target colors certainly, uh, could have some social uh, benefits, but one thing we got to also look at is clubs are already at times struggling with the cost of putting on matches, and uh, as soon as you start talking about any other colors besides brown and white, it's going to be more expensive to buy targets. Would it would uh, it so have to be, or would it be a situation of um, instead of the binary choice of this or that? you now can also use others, which would then potentially expand the marketplace of people offering different targets. I'm straight up question. Correct. I really don't know. Well, well, I think like that, the brown, that that obviously creating a market for that, for a product of a different color certainly would, you know, likely bring down costs of that. But I don't think we're ever going to see anything cheaper than producing cardboard targets that are simply brown in color. Yeah. yeah. Um, right. So it's just like the, is, color, the color it, of raw cardboard stock. But, yeah. but why not red for hardcover or something? You know what I mean? Well, just you're paying then for dark. You know, yeah. But you know, it's, it's possible. Yeah. Paint, paints, paint tape. Yep. So if we're talking about making this more mainstream, then I think we're, we're probably going to have to look. So one, humanoid targets is, is, a, is a big factor, but two, it's just it's just the nature of how we how we shoot and score matches. It is not a spectator sport. No, it is not. It, there is no. no way in our current state to make uh, the hit factor scoring sexy for a spectator. Um, and everybody that I have come watch me and friends and family, I just, I forward, I'm like, Hey, this is not, it's not a fun sport to watch. Like you're going to see me shoot for 30 seconds and then you're gonna have to wait an hour yeah. and you're going to have no idea how I did while I'm shooting until oh. a couple minutes after the fact. Um, Really, and I, I've thought about this a lot. Like it, well, the way that we those... structure it is, it's it's going to have to change significantly to the point where I, I don't think we're ready for it. Where we're looking at more of the falling steel matches and the reactive, you know, it's going to have to be steel stuff that people can see immediately to make it more quote unquote mainstream. Well, some some of that can be addressed. It depends on your match. Um, you know, my my club matches, you typically have your score before you've picked your mags up off the floor, after off the ground. Uh, we run live score logging. You, you get an email right away. Um, but, you know, as far as, uh, you know, to appeal to the masses, man, there's, there's trap is an Olympic sport, and that is just like watching paint dry. Mm -hmm. But it's still an Olympic sport. Well, I think, in, the, I think and, one of the challenges at the end of the day, I mean, that here, here's, here's one of the issues that I have. Everybody, everybody wants to expand the sport. We need more people. We need more people. Um, this year, um, at slips up, particularly in the summer, we had, we had two, we have two matches a month and we had over a hundred people, um, at each match and we're running like 16 man squads at a certain point. Like we don't have the facilities to actually expand and grow this sport. So how much more mainstream and big are we going to make it if we don't have a place to put people in the first place? I mean, carry optics sold out. I mean, it's sold out and there was like a bazillion person waiting list that most people didn't get into. We already Shut have up. like more people so, than we need. And I, so, I, it's not, it's not perfect, but the idea is there. Well, it's, it's a it's a chicken and egg problem, you know, because yeah. <laughs> obviously if we created more demand for it, then people would, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. Right. Or vice yeah. versa. And so um, those problems are not easy to solve. That's for sure. Uh, Scott, it sounds like you had something to add. Well, I mean, it's more to your business model. I mean, Riley, you said earlier about the, the cost of a match. If, if you price your match appropriately, um, your club will be profitable. Um, and you know, I, I come from that, doing wrong. from that business <laughs> background, Robert, you know, my answer to you is you need to rate prices. I know yeah. you're not I, charging I, I, enough. No, objectively. I know. I do know. I, that. We could say the same thing about nationals and well, Nas so nationals objectively nationals, should be, it should be a lot more expensive than it should. That's, it should. that's, that's well, not even we're debatable at this point. So, so but nationals, how do you do that? Nationals is a, is a funny beast, right? Um, 
Well, it doesn't have to make money, but it sure shouldn't be losing that much well, money. So, Case, you said something earlier in the conversation about a 10% threshold, um, you know, to be viable. Well, less than 10% of the membership shoots nationals each year. Oh, yeah. That's true. I mean, I think that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or 16 unique individuals, right? Because you have the, the pro shooters that they go to all of them, right? Mm -hmm. They go to all of them. So they, so, you know, yeah, we, we may have 400, 500 people in a match, but I would argue that a hundred of them are the same people that shoot every nationals. Yeah. And to be fair, that's the area matches as well. Cause I mean, I've traveled around, I've shot a bunch Correct. of area matches Correct. and I see the same friends every single time. And which is awesome because to which me, is it's part like of the family reason. reunion. Well, it literally yeah. is. I get yeah. to see my friends. So, yeah. you know, that, 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 that's kind to... of a, a big separate conversation on, on what is the goal of nationals? Um, you know, I, I agree that it, that it's never going to, it, it's nationals. I, I don't think can ever have the same standard that an area match is where you, you basically, you have to break even, um, you know, it's, it, it should be the biggest, it, it needs to be our Olympics for lack of a better term. And, and I, I feel like having five of them, we've kind of watered this down. Um, and, and I don't want to demean what Jake has done because Jake has done a fantastic job. I, I can't speak highly enough of him, but I just wonder what, what should our real goal for that be? You know, and we're getting a little off topic here. Well, the nationals, the division at nationals is, is, is huge, especially for somebody, uh, you know, for a lot of our more hardcore followers and, and, and folks and, and, the ones that really care about um, how much competition there is in each division right. um, which, which I, I think I would fall under that category. Like I don't want to see divisions at nationals with 20 people in them. Um, or well, and I, th I think, don't you think if you had one nationals, then you had to pick your division. You, you would, I think you that's you how would, you should do it. That I, way, but that, that gets an, into a problem of, you know, like, to do that, you, you have to then have enough people in it, which means you then have to have a location, which means you then have to have a place that could have like 27 stages to actually make a proper nationals. Yeah. You've so there's have enough people to make it profitable. The, yeah. Right. Well, no, I, I don't think it needs to be well, profitable. Like pro I, said, profitable. Pro I, I don't, it, okay. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. It doesn't have to be profitable, but all right, look at the end of the day, you can't, you can't keep lo losing money on your loss leaders and not make it up somewhere else. And if you're not making it up somewhere else, then eventually something has to give. Yeah. So if you have one nationals and that, and you just know it's going to be a loss, yeah. it's way better than having three. However, a hundred percent. I guess yeah, hundred percent. However, if you're going to have one, I absolutely understand the argument that you're not getting enough shooters in. Um, because there's well, a lot of people well, that want to shoot nationals. It, it depends. And I get that. It, it depends. I mean, look at shotgun world shoot. I mean, I just saw the stages for that. It's 30 stages over five days. You shoot six stages a day. You're there for five days of competition. You can yeah. get a lot of people through when you're doing, you know, I think they're, they're doing eight man squads, two flights a day. So what's that? I can't do the math right this late. Um, so 30 times eight is 240. 240. So you're doing 480 competitors a day. Yeah. And you get a yeah, rest so day in there one. for every flight of shooters. So everyone shoots three out of the four days. You get a whole nother flight of shooters right. rotated in. So if yeah. we, if we go to a one nationals and we add a day or two, uh, we could go from 500 to a thousand and maybe that's less capacity than we're at now, but I it's don't necessarily be believe. Yeah. I, I don't believe that we have to have room for, I've had, I've, I've understood people have made the argument that we should have room for folks that want to shoot nationals. I'm in the camp that it nationals should be the most competitive people who want to shoot the match. Um, if are, there are, are room you, for, are you for C or D make, class shooters, are you, willing to, are you willing to make, the people who are at that level, are you willing to make them pay the fee necessary to actually be the exclusive? Because if not, then it takes those C and D people to actually show up and pay because they're the vast majority of the people that are paying those entry fees. It's certainly not the Nilses and the JJs. Those guys are getting comped in through their through their sponsors. And so, so, well, so me, me I'm not getting it. I'm not getting a slot. 
Uh, right. But I'm, I'm, I'm competitive. I want to be up towards the top. I'm not going to win a nationals, but I, I, I yeah. want to be, com- I want to be shooting against really competitive people. Oh, I, I agree. I with would you. pay I, I just way don't know more that. than I'm worth paying right now. I would. And I think a lot of people would. Um, but again, like I think some of those C and D class shooters that are, that are shooting nationals, um, if there's room for them, great. However, I don't think they should take precedence over some of the more competitive guys. So, and, and I'm, this is just given the fact that if we're talking about reducing the number of folks that are at nationals in, in, in total, I, well, I, if, if, if nationals is about choosing a national champion, uh, which is kind of the, I think the end, the end state of like arguments about tightening up the numbers of people there and so forth. There's not really a need to, uh, to, to super expand like the, the to super, you don't need to worry about the like people getting in because the people who are very much likely to win are getting in by the by the comp slots anyway. Yeah, like that. I think yeah. That, so that, the, that, the, that sword cuts both ways. The national yeah. champion is going to be the national champion regardless. You're correct, but we're we're talking about it if we want to reduce the number of nationals and uh, to to go to one to have one nationals where. It's all the divisions, and, and if we do that, we're talking about a lot less people, and that's where my argument would be. Now you really got to have the discussion of the top folks got to be there. Yeah, so they like, want to be there. I like. So here's I like the question: slots. I like maybe a lottery for the. Uh, so the rest. I, I think the vast majority of the slots are assigned based on performance, and the open entries are all slots that were sent to the sections and returned unused. Hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you yeah, know, if all the section, if all the sections use their match, use their slots and awarded them, then the match would be filled based on performance. But yeah. not everyone does yeah. that. That's you know? that's that's my understanding as well. Uh, and, you know, talking to other area directors, uh, that is true. Yeah. So if we if we were to hold so just, the just nationals to, as a go ahead. Just to touch on Nick Nick Walden, he commented on that. And then uh, just pause for a minute. This Tommy's comment, pay more for matches. I, I think if, if any competitor that shoots beyond a uh, their local match, if they were to total up what they spend on travel, ammo, everything else, the match <laughs> no, 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 fee no, 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 is no, no. by we don't, far We don't ever talk about that. Smallest, Let's just keep that on the down low. The match <laughs> fee is by far the smallest expense of an, a USPSA competitor by orders of magnitude. I, I, I mean, I, I would guess some of us here that are pretty serious about training, your, your last bullet order costs more than all of your club match fees for the year combined. <laughs> That's actually a really yes. good point. When you put it in that kind of perspective, um, yeah, that's a good point. Here's a question I have, though. If we made it one nationals where everybody shows up, I mean, if you want to shoot production, single stack, revolver, whatever, but, you know, it's only going to be the one nationals, would that change the participation numbers? And how much do you think it would? Because I think there's a lot of people that shoot a division uh, because they know that they're going to go shoot carry optics because it's only 100 miles away from them, or they shoot single stack or production because it's just right in their backyard. But if you only had one nationals and that nationals was like, you decide on the division you're going to shoot. And then that's what you're going to shoot. And that's what you'll be crowned as. It's not like, you know, Hey, I'm the ladies champion 10 times over this year or something crazy like that. That actually changed our participation and how the participation actually works itself out. I don't know in what direction, but I think you would see changes in that participation over the course of the entire year like just yeah. seeing yes. like when my local matches or my section matches fall in relation to various nationals like last year my section match was the weekend before carry optics nationals mm-hmm. and it was in area five with carry optics nationals yeah it was a huge huge percentage of co shooters just tuning up for nationals and i'm Makes sure sense. that's the case all over the country with different matches yep. yeah i mean well, if you were going to make one nationals you would have want to have it in the end of the year and you know it, it would be the the culmination um you know i ideally in, in a perfect world king for a day I, I would set nationals in an october time frame and then i would put the edict out to all the area matches and say you must be done by no more than two weeks before nationals oh area two would be pissed yep. you you <laughs> must you must have all of your area matches done so that you have the opportunity to tune up and and then yeah. you shoot shoot nationals 
Um, and if you if you have to pick the division, then I think you're going to see you'll see some competitors drift out. Some some of the some of the heat will drift out into other divisions uh, to be that true champion, and then you you make it worth it. Yeah, I think that I think the I think one of the big big advantages of having a, of a single nationals is it would actually as a as a product it would actually force the stages to get better because yes. i mean the best stage designs that ever are created is done by somebody who they build the stage and then they actually st take a step back before it's on the ground they're like okay if i shot single stack how would i shoot this if i shot revo how would i shoot this if i shot with an open gun and you go through every single one of the divisions yep. and you examine the stage with that in mind because if you do that as a stage designer, you start to see all the little things and like the ways that a Revo would want to have to do and like, oh, they're going to have a standing reload here. Can we fix this? Can we open up options? If you do that at when everybody's shooting like one big nationals, it stops some of the weird janky stuff that only shows up at like um, the last nationals where you had these like 27 bazillion yard shots that just crushed all the iron guys. Yeah, shooting yeah, an eight can't... round division makes me a better stage designer yeah. for sure yeah. well, in that would, in that way. I think I'm with you comes, that comes mainly from the the, uh, the fact that almost everyone uh, nowadays is like a, a high cap shooter first and foremost. Uh, yeah, not not you, mm -hmm. but uh, but yeah. every, everyone's this... got everyone's got a lot more high cap experience. So yeah. like a sprinkling of irons and a sprinkling of low cap will make you a better stage designer. As shooting a little bit of high cap makes me a better stage designer. This is a slight We're... tangent, but it's related. Um, I've had the conversation with a couple people on whether or not production should go to 15 rounds and where they always land on why it should is because they think it would mesh better with modern stage design, which I think is a huge cop out. If you can't make a stage interesting for 10 rounds and the solution is to move it to 15 rounds, that is the wrong answer. 100%. And I think but how do you, a lot how of, do you get your stage designers to figure that out, Leif? Well, some of the rule well, book um, ambiguity in the wording of you're not allowed to require more than eight rounds per position or view. It didn't used to be, it didn't used to read that way. It used to be, you can't require more than eight rounds in any position. And then there was a lot of, well, what defines a position? There's no linear measurement on what's one position, what's another position. And people were saying, well, it's one step. It's one and a half steps that that's subjective. And then they just added or view in there and it just became totally ambiguous. So now, there was a couple stages at a uh, handgun nationals where it was pretty much a 16 round position with a half a step. That's right. all it was. Yeah. And that's, and so that's, how, that's, that's how would you fix that? Design. I would, I wouldn't go as far as the IPSC rule on that is much different. And I know we're, we've had discussions about how we're differentiated from IPSC and we shouldn't align or what have you, but they, you're not allowed to have more than eight rounds available from a position in IPSC. So when I'm designing stages and proofing stages, I go a little more conservative than that. And I try to limit it to 10 possible rounds from any given position. I think that's so, a pretty good balance. And I think what you're doing is smart and it's a good way to do it. The challenge is how do we take the really smart things that you've thought of and then like actually push that out to the national organization, to the sections and the clubs and things like that. Cause I mean, and that's the challenge because there's a lot of really smart conversations being had about how to build stages that are actually quality that ultimately would, I mean, cause honestly, if you think about it, if you made stages that were, that were more friendly to the low cap shooters, would you have more low cap shooters? I think the arguments, maybe it's not going to move it a ton, but I think you would have more people shooting it's, those low it's caps. It's not going to bring it back, but never, mm -hmm. but no. it would make it more fun. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so, I, I mean, we're talking I, about I, our designing a stage for that that accommodates ten percent of the folks that come shoot your match. Yeah, but it doesn't. It just, doesn't take away from that stage in any yeah. other division. I, I, I agree, but it's a lot. It is a lot of effort. It's a lot of effort to properly think through that. I, I would to, argue to that. But I think it's okay. I think it's okay. I think it's a mindset. I think it's just it, a mindset more than an effort. But wouldn't you say it's much it's much truer to say a stage that is good for a low cap division is going to be good for all divisions and a stage that's good for a high cap division is not going to be good for all divisions. That's very true. As a rule. I would agree I, with that. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Why we're talking about stage design, let's talk about match design. More is not always better, especially when it comes to yes. round count. Yes. 
Yeah, I think I think COVID. Don't say that, that in for Pennsylvania. Us. You'll get shot. That was one of the good things that came out of COVID and <laughs> ammo shortages. Is people started cutting round counts down in matches and just removing a bunch of useless filler targets. And it really showed people that there's no point. It's not testing any other additional skills. You're just, it's all filler. See, and I think if you take that a step farther, uh, especially at your level two pluses, short courses can really set the, distinguish the, the true fundamental, solid fundamental competitors versus the people that get lucky. Oh That's yeah. I mean, Keanu or, or the track for, stars. Um, Keanu for a number of years uh, was doing at the area A matches. It was basically the Ipsic style of kind of that three, two, one format. And arguably those were yeah. some of the funnest matches to shoot because you can actually design really clever and involved stages that aren't a high count, a high round count. It's all just like yep. thinking about how to make something creative and be, and what did you say, Leif? It's a mindset, right? It's a, yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't see it as additional effort. If you're already in that mindset and you know what you're looking for, it's not like you're going above and beyond to accomplish something in addition to what you're already doing. It's just your standard. It's yeah. just what you're doing. Yeah. Like it, it, it's looking at the eight rounds per position thing as a cap to be avoided from below, not a limit that, uh, right. Like a, not that's a good way of saying it. Top, yeah. No, that's yeah. a good way of saying it. Yeah. We've all been to the match where it's run here and shoot eight rounds run here shoot eight rounds run here shoot eight rounds yeah that's boring too yeah 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 now i, I do want to go back because case said some or i think it was case somebody said something earlier that um it's not a spectator sport but i will say this at a facility like cameo if we didn't have the the, the law issue with um capacity that's, that's going to get fixed Hopefully, I, I'm with you, Robert. I'm, I'm I, yeah, I've got my I, fingers I, crossed. I, I feel very confident that Cameo is going to come online. But to be fair, you're also going to see Sups in and, and St. George. You're going to see that one be a national contender within the next year. But there's a new the range way... going in in South Dakota, also. Oh, yeah, mm, that's yeah. good. That's good. 30, the way Cameo 30 is plus up, base. Wow, well, Cameo is wired for it, too. Like, yes. Um, yeah. you can put cameras on every single stage and have it hardwired into the internet. So there is a, so much more you can do at that range from a, um, a viewer standpoint where right. I could make it more interesting for cases, family and friends to watch him shoot on TV than oh, in person. Right. But yeah, live streaming a match isn't, doesn't make it viewable. Right, right. No, yeah. but the no, way you do it does. Yeah, no, it, it's all in the context. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. USPSA, I don't think, is ever going to be a very, like, a great sport to live, to watch, like, to watch a stage run live until we get, like, AI, machine learning, computer vision scoring of the targets. One and that's, day. But, but you, you, don't, you don't need that necessarily to make, to make a watchable uh, a watchable take on a stage or an interesting take on a match. Um, well, you, and yeah, that like, technology, Jay, exists. Yeah, you could see it at CMP on the rifle ranges. Yeah, it, it is. It, uh, it's much easier when you have uh, fixed fixed targets as opposed to yes, to like have to to, to move it off the stage or set NCAA, up. NCAA, yeah, other people have it. Well, it's, and Dave it's, Dave Blanton, the was it the humble marksman? He talked he's talked about this a bunch where he said, I mean, it would it would go a long way to have. I mean, if you had two people like the analyst and the color yeah. commentary guy, correct, yep. who could yep. really yep. explain, you know, oh, you know, Case went and he ran, and he took this position because in doing that, it it saved him position, even though he took a longer shot. It really let's see if the hit yeah. fact, the hit factor works out for him and stuff like that. So in mm -hmm. in a, in Formula One broadcasts, I think I think it was mostly last year they had a. Like over the course of the week, they had a little segment called "Good Lap, Great Lap," where they'd take two, uh, you know, two two circuits around one track and identify the little things that made one better than the other. And that would be easy to do with the technology we have now for USPSA, and that's that's watchable. Um, it's it's a little bit more for like the interested fan than for the casual viewer, but it's still uh, it's still relatively watchable in the sense that you have that analyst to to say what's important. Uh, which is kind of hard to tease out when you're when you're watching something like something like this for the first time. Correct. We don't have the the, the sport doesn't have the money to that's to pay for sort of live streaming. <laughs> well, that's but that's it, it's a hundred thousand dollars. It's a hundred thousand dollars for a couple day live stream. I mean, and, and even if you're talking about like a delayed, uh, Nick, you're yeah. talking about a delayed um, with AMG timers and scored hits. I think that's a great way to do it. Talk about a sixty minute delay, but it. 
and that'd be great, probably be cheaper. But if you're talking about um, commentary, I mean, there's just no way. There's no money for that. Correct. Not not now. I but mean, that's back, right. back to the conversation there, earlier there about people... changing the targets and making yes. it more mainstream because then the money will come. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, absolutely. Even even now, like there there are people on this call who would do that for free. Like, <laughs> I'd I'd, I I'd go to, I'd, yeah. I'd go to a Karyoptics Nationals and shoot staff day, and I would be on the range with a camera and a notebook and uh, there to tell stories about what's go about what goes on. Like even uh, well, look even at the, Brian Conley. I mean, yeah, he exactly. wanders around. And yeah. he's, he's doing a fantastic job just like walking around. He's showing he's showing people shooting the stage. I mean, arguably watching him is more exciting than actually watching the live stream half the time. I agree. Yeah. I agree. In a lot of ways, the membership is not utilized enough. Yeah, we have uh, a very that's... wide, wide skill base in the membership and they need to yeah. be more involved from a committee standpoint, from not just volunteering as match staff, but there's a lot of other contributions they could make and they'd probably love to make. Yeah. That's really, and that, that one, unfortunately, is a problem where there's a lot of people that are willing and there's not a lot of, <sighs> sorry, Scott, headquarters doesn't give a shit about the people. And I know that's a hard thing to say, but sometimes there's the perception. I think so. I've actually had uh, the last, the last two nationals I've been to, uh, very productive conversations with uh, with Jake and Rick about the stats work I've been doing and about ways to bring that a little bit more first party. Uh, we haven't had a chance Ooh. to connect yet since then, but I'm hoping over this off season uh, we get a chance. I hope so. That'd be awesome, action. Robert. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit on that. I don't okay, think it's enough. that they don't give a shit. It's that they don't have the um, the mature leadership oh. skills to bring this organization uh, together in that regard. Because I think they do care. I just don't think they, you know, some what? Of them know yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Can I walk that back? I agree. You're right. That That's me being hyperbolic. You're right. Also, with respect to like utilizing membership more, uh, I agree. There's probably a ton of people out there with amazing skill sets that could be utilized. But you got to have a structure in place yeah. to effectively put those to use mm -hmm. um, to just to even organize it and um, make sure that it happens like that, that, that you, it takes effort. It takes, uh, some time and organization to have that actually work effectively. So, I mean, it should absolutely be done and it could be done, but yes, we who's, want, who's Tim, actually we take, want like, Tim to do color ability and yes. responsibility for that and make it happen, you know, hundred yeah. percent Riley. Well, that, like, that's yeah. where, that's where yeah. committees comprised of membership rather than just board members. Cause the board have, has enough on their plates. They can't yeah, be managing agreed. that as well, but they can oversee committees. I think well, and, I, and with with Jake's position and him trying to do the media stuff and run nationals, hopefully That's next year, tough. since he won't be doing the national stuff, he'll be able to focus more on that and maybe be able to do more yeah. on that aspect of it. So That's true. No, it would it would it would actually be really nice if you could get uh, more involvement in terms of just. I mean, I've said for a long time, I, w I wish there were, we used to have like a match director's handbook. Um, I wish there was like stage designers handbook ways for stage designers to get together and just compare like, Hey, I have this idea. And we have some of those things through like Facebook and things like that, but it would be nice to have some kind of a, a living document of sorts that you could hand a stage designer or a match director. Here's all the sure. things that I've learned over time. And so that you don't have to fail where I failed. There actually is one being updated that I don't know exactly when it's going to be officially rolled out, but I've talked to a couple people at, at the org and they are working on a revised match director handbook. That's pretty comprehensive. Nice. That'd be great. That'd be, that'd actually be really handy. Cause I, I know there's a lot, I know there's a lot of people, um, at least locally who they're like, yeah, I'll help. I'm like, okay, well, can you do this? I'm like, uh, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, well, I'll help you. Yeah. And that all brings up a really great point with respect to like, we all want to see participation increase. We want to see the sport grow. Uh, we want to see clubs succeed and, and, and again, grow. Uh, but, you know, and this is a conversation I've had numerous times with uh, one of my good buddies, uh, Charlie Perez, local, you know, he runs one of our local matches. Uh, and uh, of course, very, very good, you know, national level limited guy. And, uh, you know, just talking about, the support from HQ down to the, like actually making it down to the club level. Um, you know, cause it's, 
like we would see the sport grow if clubs had, I think, greater resources uh, available to them in a more um, structured manner, you know, because there's clubs that are incredibly successful because they figure it out and they have great people, you know, making it happen. Um, there's other clubs that are, are certainly less successful that maybe it's just because they don't know how to effectively run a match and how to run their club and how to structure everything. But seeing a little more support down at the local level, I think would be, would, would go a long ways. Yeah. I agree. Can you give some examples of what, what you, what would you like to see? Well, well, I think what, what we just touched on here right just now, I think is a really great example of, um, having more in the way of structured manuals, um, training, uh, more like, and I think that it, again, it's going to vary from area to area and also section of section. Cause there's some like area directors and section coordinators that are way more involved than others. Um, you know, that are, you know, they try to make every match they can, that they're working, you know, matches that they're supporting match directors, kind of guiding them and holding their hand at times. Um, I think that that it's hit or miss across the board as far as consistency from, you know, Florida to, to Washington and California to, to Maine, as far as, you know, uh, the kind of integration you see top down from HQ to area to section to, you know, local guys. Do you think it's the best use of a, an area director's time to work a stage in a match? No, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, no, no, no. Just, just, I'm kind of shifting gears here a little bit. Sure. I, 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 I really appreciate when I do see that. Cause I think it's really like, I, I I'm always impressed when I see an area director that actually works the stage. Cause that just surprises me, I guess. I think I, ex I expect to see them doing sure. other important work, I suppose. Um, so that's always appreciated. I definitely want area directors and other leaders doing what's most important to making, you know, it, it all be a success. Um, I wouldn't say I have enough experience running matches, especially at the, that, those levels, to really know where they should be. Um, but, you know, I, just to make a comment to you, Scott, I really enjoyed Area 3 this last year. I thought it was incredibly well run. I enjoyed bumping into you a couple of times at the match, you know, and just kind of seeing that you were obviously working hard to uh, make Area 3 a success. Uh, I definitely think it was a success. Uh, and, you. you know, and so whatever you were doing, good sir, I thought you did a stellar job. Keep, yeah. keep doing but, but in general, I guess I would expand that question to the panel and including yep. you, Dave. Is it the, the best use of an area director or president of the USPSA's time at a national or level three event to work a stage? Yeah. I, kind of, I guess I think it depends on what their responsibilities are uh, beforehand. You know, if, if the area director is deeply involved in running the match from an administrative perspective, it might be better for them to be you know, in the shack, uh, ready to, to meet any issues that come up. If they bid stages and let the, uh, let the other area members, let, other, let the other people in the area, uh, rise to the occasion, put the match on themselves. Maybe there's not a better place than to be than on a stage. And I think, I think it, again, it kind of, it kind of depends on the, the scenario we're talking about. Yeah. What, what I, about I would, it? Go ahead. I was going to say at nationals, I don't think the president should be running a stage. I think he should be roaming around, checking everything out, greeting people, talking to them. Same thing that area director at their match. That person should be free, not not stuck to one spot the entire match. Nationals put area directors on on all the different stages. Uh, that's not a bad idea there. Not the, as a punishment. That's all. Jay no, but I'm just and, trying to decide. <laughs> What, what's the best way to serve the membership? Is it to, to work that stage or is it to to go around and give the membership a chance to, to bend the ear and say, hey, these are my concerns? Scott, right? I, mean, I mean, how I mean, what other format do you have um, the membership coming to you in a consistent fashion unless you're a uh, an RO. I mean, if you're an RO on a stage, they're going to be there at some point during the match. So they'll all have yeah. an opportunity. If you're just wandering around, they're not going to have as much of that opportunity because maybe you're on the north end of the range and they're on the south end and you just cross. There is yeah. that. There is that. You'll see them, but you might have the, not have the capacity to have an in-depth conversation uh, yeah. about yeah. something and, and I guess, away uh, from what they're supposed to be yeah, doing. I, I would guess if, if, I, if I'm there as an RO, 
uh, I'm I don't have time for the same level of, of interaction. I, th- I think Riley, Riley kind of hit it on the head. I didn't work a stage at Area Three. Uh, I wasn't the RM. My job there was to to kind of continue the management role to make sure the match r- ran, but then to make myself available. I would say the the majority of every moment, I, majority of every day that I was on the range at Area Three, I was interacting with one mem one member or another about something um and, and i'm just trying to decide how i govern my myself going forward as an area director you know what what should the priority be well and because, you because the board as a whole has but, this perception that we do not we 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 are not receptive to the membership Scott, well, so first of all, that doesn't apply to you. I don't think anybody's ever said that. Uh, it's been pretty clear since you've taken office that you are not only receptive, but you're actively seeking it out. I mean, you gave me a call and we chatted for like an hour uh, one time. Um, nobody's ever having any issues getting in touch with you. Um, mm-hmm. So it, it's definitely personality driven. You're doing what you need to do. Uh, and there was another area director who I ran across at handgun nationals. who was ROing. Um, I don't remember which one it was. Um, was obviously wasn't my art, uh, area AD cause you're my AD. However, um, I, I, I didn't have a conversation with him because I'm in competitive mode. He's in RO mode. That's mm-hmm. not the, the proper yeah. time to have a conversation. Yep. Yep. So if, if the yeah. argument comes up that be, be an RO at a national so that you're, open to conversations from the membership. I don't, I, I don't agree with that because you're going to be focused on making sure that the match runs smoothly, getting the people uh, in and out of the stage as a competitor. I'm going to be focused on shooting. I think, I, I, I think I, I, the role of an area director at the end of the day is to, is to be open and accessible to their membership. And if the membership send you emails, then the area director should understand that part of their duty is to be responding to those emails. If they call, they call. And if you find that you can serve your membership best by being on the range, but not necessarily working a stage and, and you have, you've already developed that, that personality that, that you're approachable, then you should do that. But if you're an, an area director that likes to, that likes to work a stage and because it gives you the opportunity to talk to the people as they come through, even though maybe you're just doing stats or something like that for it, uh, then do it. I think at the end of the day, the area directors should want to be, um, approachable by the membership and however they choose to do that i'm actually okay i just want to know that like if i if i show up at a, at a match and my area director's there um i can go talk to him and i may not be able to talk to him just right that minute but i'll find some time during or after the match is over and we can have we can have a chat and honestly all the area directors i've ever talked to um they've always i mean in person that's the thing in person everybody's chill right it's only when we get online that we turn into uh the not so better angels of our nature. <laughs> I'd like to hear Leif's thought on the this this current topic because uh, you're running for AD. Yeah, no, I, I think um, it's not necessarily the best use of their time to be uh, an RO on a given stage. I would like to, and maybe some areas do this, but I haven't heard of it. Um, have an actual area meeting at the area match. It could be two different things. It could be like at the conclusion of staff day as competitors are coming into walk stages for the next day, something like that. Have what's kind of structurally the same as the membership meeting at nationals, but an area specific meeting. Um, I think Our area one does that life. Do they? Yeah, okay. every time. And it's, and people, uh, he, it's usually for the section coordinators and the match directors, but they don't, they don't turn people away. And Bruce Gary is very open about uh, talking to people and telling what he can and what he can't, obviously. Right. But um, yeah, in, it, it in is in a good addition, format. Yeah. In addition to talking people th- to people throughout the day, but it could be a good panel type discussion. Mm-hmm. And I also think an area match is a good opportunity for the area director to touch base with all of the major match directors in the area to get schedules worked out for the following year to try yep. to get, keep matches from stepping on each other's toes. Yeah. Good thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. And I, I was, my whole thing about them not ROing is I know I've tried to have conversations with people I knew who were ROing. And I was shooting and it was still difficult with everything going on in the stage. That's why I say your time is still limited where maybe 
maybe the area director is centrally located in a certain area so that when you came through, you would have that opportunity to chat with them. But it's it's not easy to have those conversations with people when they're working, you're shooting and taping and, and all of that. Well, I think there's the other, I mean, it's kind of the elephant in the room that, I mean, it, it does not benefit an area director or a president of USPSA to actually uh, work a stage anymore because you're now, you're now, if you do something that's perceived as right, wrong, good or bad, I'm not getting into that. There is that concern right. that that's because that's a rule in the bylaws that says, you know, that uh, one person can, can remove it. So there is that concern. So maybe from that perspective, you don't want to be an, be an RO on a stage and instead you should just uh, set out to go find and talk to as many members as you can. And you're opening yourself up to potentially have to serve on an arbitration committee if there's an issue, like you're saying, or yeah. they could get perceptions could get a little skewed. Isn't it too bad that we have to worry about that? It is unfortunate. Yeah. It's, it's something that should be addressed and it's, it's the classic thing. I mean, it was, it was done with good intentions and uh, the intention was good, but the actual practical application was less to be desired. Right. The reality of it is not the same. Yeah. Unintended consequences be what they may. Yes. Yeah. Gentlemen, I think we've covered pretty much everything <laughs> from <laughs> statistics to, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, it was great discussion though, but I know people have to, those of us uh, on the East coast. So if you're in area seven, eight or six, um, it's been dark for like 17 hours already. So uh, and we used to have to get up when it's dark again, son of them. Anyway, um, does anybody else have anything that they, a comment that they wanted to state that they never got a chance to? No, so. other than honestly, USPC is still good. Yeah. And I mean, oh, at, the, yeah. at the level, yeah. I mean, everybody's having a good time. And at, at the end of the day, just go out there, shoot, have fun, get involved with your local club. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's the local club. I always say that like, I'm a member of USC, USPSA, but slips, a slips is my home. And I think, I think the more we remember that, um, the more inclined we are to get involved and help out our club and do and to, and like volunteer where we can. I think we'll continue to make USPSA great. Right. Absolutely. Right. It's it's the people, not the organization. And and I guess to make sure that that to a certain extent you got to keep the faith. Uh, if we if we all exit, uh, then it will go away. Yeah. Yeah, we got some Billy Joel tonight, keeping the faith. We got some Bobby Brown, my prerogative. What what is up with you people? Uh, all we need is your Great Danes trucking through, Dave. Yeah, well, it used to be a common thing until they all started dying. Oh, oh well, I'm sorry about that. It's all good. It's all good. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate you coming on. It's a lot of time you spent talking about this stuff, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you for putting it together. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. Make Thanks, sure we're Dave. not missing.